palliative care colloquium here at the Archdiocese of Boston. We're thrilled to have you. There are several hundred of you who are going to be here, most of whom I guess are in the room. Uh, but we're thrilled to be able to say that at the end of today, we will have concluded the first five years of our initiative. And it has been quite a ride. All of you have made us feel so welcome. Many of you are repeat visitors to our colloquium, and we are delighted to have you here. The topic for this year's colloquium really grew out of last year's program, which was caring for the caregiver. And that struck such a chord that we decided to broaden the topic this year and talk about caregiving on both sides of the bed rail. So among you are uh, many more physicians, nurses, social workers, and chaplains than we have typically had. And we welcome all of you. I, I think part of the, the point that we want to make right from the get-go is that for all of the family caregivers that there are who feel stressed out and um, feel the burden of the care that they have, both in terms of the physical burden, the exhaustion, and the psychological burden, but also just of wanting to do the right thing. The decisions that are being placed on uh, our frail elderly and the proxies for them on our patients and the families who love and support them. So we wanted to talk about that today. What does that look like and how does it feel for both the professional caregiver as well as the family caregiver? I think all of you who were here last year were as struck as I was by the statistic that Gay Maytal gave us. Um, there are more than 49 million, more than 49 million unpaid family caregivers in America. That was last year's statistic, and I would warrant that it has increased in the years since we met here. What do we do about that? You know, here at the Archdiocese, we're not a healthcare providing organization. Uh, what we do mostly is pastoral care. But part of pastoral care is understanding what the folks in our benches, in our parish halls, in our schools, and in every way in which our faith community uh, lives their lives. What are they facing? What are they going through? Most of us are going through it too. You have all over the years who have come here for the four meetings now um, ha heard me refer to and have met my 93-year-old mother who is in her 10th year of dialysis. Well, mom went to God in February. So that part of my caregiving has ended. I'll be okay. <laughs> But I so understand the, the dilemmas that you are facing. And I'm also a nurse who's worked in palliative care since the concept was first articulated in the 80s. And I understand what it's like standing on the other side of the bed rail as well. So I think we're going to have a great morning today. I want to, before we get any further, introduce Father William Joy, who is the Associate Vicar General of the Archdiocese and who is going to welcome us officially. You want to just hold that? I haven't said anything yet. <laughs> <laughs> On behalf of uh, His Eminence the Cardinal, who's in Rome uh, this weekend, and Bishop Uglietto, who's uh, out doing confirmations uh, this morning, I welcome you all to our pastoral center and to this wonderful day. This is really one of the highlights of the year. Uh, this particular colloquium has really taken off in the last few years, so I welcome all of you. Th those who are caregivers really are the, the hidden saints of our parishes and of our society. Uh, and as our society becomes less and less involved with one another on, on a personal basis, we, we text and we communicate uh, through the cloud now, uh, we run a risk of really uh, not understanding how it is to care for one another. Uh, and so it's very important uh, that we have colloquiums like this and that we uh, really uh, understand that it is a person-to-person -person sort of world that we, we really need. And so as you gather today, I, I wish you all a uh, a wonderful day, and let us begin in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. <clears throat> Almighty God, as we gather on this first Saturday of April, we come to you as people who seek wisdom and understanding. We seek your guidance, and we seek the Holy Spirit to come upon us. We come to you as people who try to live out your gospel by caring for one another, especially those who need acute care. We come to you, O Lord, and ask you to open our minds and our hearts to your word and to your presence this day. And as we gather on this particular first Saturday, we, we pray to the one who perhaps is the great caregiver of all, Our Lady. And so let us pray 
Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. And thank you and have a great, great day. Thanks, Father Joy. He hates when I do this, but I call him Father What a Joy. I think that's kind of clever, don't you? <laughs> so let me just breeze through a couple of um, housekeeping uh, details. The first, and every year on the evaluations we get notices that we never cover this. There are no financial conflicts associated with this program. There have been no um, compensation, no underwriting, no sponsors. Uh, so no conflicts for the speakers, for the development of the program, for the hosts who are delivering the program. Everybody got it? Remember that. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, I think everybody has discovered that there are restrooms beside the elevator. We're all grown-ups here, so please use them as you need to come and go, but as dis least disruptively as possible. There's a break scheduled. Many of you have already stopped over across uh, the way at the cafe and had some, some breakfast. Feel free to replenish and, again, come and go as least disruptively as possible. There are continuing education credits for people. I think you know this on this floor at the end of the corridor. If you take a left going out, um, you can sign in, physicians, nurses, social workers, workers and chaplains. Uh, in order to get your certificate, you'll need to return your completed evaluations. I think we all know that drill. Uh, for those of you who have not had a presentation, a workshop on palliative care, you have inside your swag bag a, a brochure about what we do in our palliative care initiative, and it has Diane McCarthy's contact information. Diane, whom you met out at the um, CE table, perhaps is, uh, is the parish outreach coordinator for our palliative care and advanced care planning initiative. Uh, please turn off or mute your cell phones. What do you bet we're going to have ringing? But never mind, please turn off your, your cell phones or mute them. I want to especially thank my colleagues, uh, Suzanne Grahl, whom you have all met either telephonically, electronically, or now in person downstairs, and Diane McCarthy, whom I just mentioned and whom you may have met at the continuing education table. They are awesome to work with day in and day out, and they have been just incredibly um, helpful and really instrumental in getting this morning's program organized and, and presented before you today. So special thanks to them, but I also want to thank Sharon and Laura uh, Struder who are here uh, as volunteers downstairs. You may have met them. You see in your packet, save the dates. We already know next year's colloquium is next April 25th. <laughs> Mark your calendars. And uh, we have our Train the Trainer, which we do every fall, uh, scheduled for our next October. That would be 2019, so really mark your calendars for that. So I'm just going to kind of set the framework, and then we'll be introducing our speakers. And I think many of us know that there's been kind of a, a big seismic, really, change in the way healthcare is delivered, both in the way that uh, we as consumers experience healthcare and the changing landscape and the way in which we have learned and hopefully are still learning how to navigate it. But there have been changes internal to the healthcare world as well. And one of the uh, first changes that I want to address, and it's by no means uh, the only one or even perhaps the most significant one, although it is hugely significant, it has resulted in the phrase that is the one that we chose for today's theme, moral distress. And that that really comes to us from the nursing literature. It comes from the nursing literature as far back as the early 80s, because in the latter half of the 20th century, we saw a, a really uh, dramatic change, a material change, an essential change in the way in which nurses do their jobs. Uh, their education changed. They went from being kind of a vocational school um, program to nursing education programs now are degree programs, bachelor's, master's, doctoral programs. The way in which nurses work and uh, are perceived within the healthcare community by healthcare colleagues, they went from in the 50s and 60s, I won't go back farther than that, but you know I, I could. Um, uh, I just, I mean, because I've read the history books, okay? <laughs> um, but uh, the way in which they were perceived really as the, um, the <laughs> I'm not kidding you, I saw this phrase when I first showed up at nursing school in the 70s, and um, I was so horrified I almost signed out the first day. Um, they were handmaidens to the physician. 
that was in a nursing textbook. That was their role. And that was a, a textbook from the 1950s. So, so the change in nursing status, the change in nursing role, the change in nursing education, it resulted in the fact that now people were also doing research about nursing and nurses and how their lives affected them and how their roles impacted patient care and the delivery of health care, et cetera. And it was in that literature that we first heard the expression moral distress. We'll talk about that in just a minute, but it's the theme of the day, so you'll hear it a, a lot. But in the same time as nursing roles were changing, so were patient status in the, in the exchange of health care. So we started seeing in the 80s, really, this dramatic emphasis on patient autonomy and patient right to decision making. It was almost strident language and the way in which we kind of, I think, at the end of the day might have overemphasized something because it was new and that's what we do when we're thinking of things in new ways. The role of patients in decision making and collaborative decision making for physicians, you know, and I don't mean them individually because they all did okay and they're wonderful people and they roll with punches, etc. But the roles changed and suddenly, you know, what was a, a fairly unilateral process in terms of decision making and what will happen and how therapeutic interventions will occur suddenly became what we called a collaborative decision making process. The idea behind it is that people would be People would be exercising, <laughs> I have no idea what just happened, but let me turn this on again. Maybe we can have another microphone. I'm one of nine children, as I said to you, in the cafeteria, so I have a very loud voice while we get a new microphone. So um, suddenly patients were being invited into the decision-making setting, and the idea of autonomy and the exercise of autonomy is that people will be making informed decisions. And so now we're, we're asking folks to explain that what's going on in, in a disease course. Explain what therapeutic implications are. Explain what the options are. Explain what the, the upsides and the downsides were. And we're asking that to be done in a setting where there's no more time to do things. There's just more stuff to do in that time. It's um, what my friends in Missouri, when I lived in Kansas City, used to call packing 20 pounds into a 10-pound bag. And, I, and I'm seeing a lot of sympathetic heads nodding. I think we all know what I'm talking about. But the implications were there. So in addition to that, at the same time, in these same kind of decades of the last half of the 20th century, we were seeing tremendous strides in information and in technological possibilities and in the information world, for sure, but also in the practice world of medicine. New options, new information, new therapies, new diagnostic methods, new, 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 and everybody was supposed to stay up to date and inform the patients as well. So it was a kind of disharmonic convergence of a lot of wonderful, wonderful, wonderful things, but it added to, um, if I could call it, the burden of healthcare delivery and the burden of participating as patients and consumers in that healthcare world. I found it as a formula for moral distress. You have information overload. <laughs> I was watching uh, an NPR show the other night and I saw uh, a physician who has long written for the New York Times and a young physician who has been doing a lot of uh, nonfiction writing, trying to explain the healthcare navigate uh, and how to navigate the landscape, the healthcare world. And both of them admitted that when they have symptoms themselves, they Google them before they go to see the doctors. <laughs> well, who doesn't, right? So there's an information overload in, in terms of what we know is sure information because it's been double blind tested in the healthcare research world and the physicians and nurse practitioners and others are responsible for that. There is an explosion of information because of the electronic virtual world that is at everybody's fingertips. There are more decision-making parties at a table. We now have patients there, that's great. But they bring with them their support networks and their proxies. And then we, we on the healthcare professional side of the building want to make sure that we've got our bases covered so we don't just have the, peop the hospitalists involved and the residents involved, but we have the attendings involved and the specialists involved. We bring in social service if appropriate. We bring in chaplaincy and nursing if appropriate. It's a pretty crowded decision-making table. And then there is a, a, a new level of sophistication in all these variables. There are more sophisticated decision makers because they all have, 
well, where is my machine, our little devices, where in the course of meetings, they're Googling what they're hearing, seriously, and I mean that for both the professionals and the family members sitting there. The data explosion, the information explosion, the time frames, there's shorter stays in hospitals where we're having to account for our times in the way that when I have my lawyer hat on, we do in 15 minute increments. And we have a variety of settings, all of which are new to somebody at the table. So we are have, you know, because of our ACO relationships that we have, we have healthcare decision making happening at home, we have it happening in community based uh, practice centers, we have it in day surgeries and, and surgery centers, we have it in hospitals, we have it, you name it. I, I actually met somebody once in the parking lot of a McDonald's, because that was the only time that they could get to raise the questions. After, after they had <laughs> seen a doctor, I was like, sure, I can meet you. Where's a good time and when? The McDonald's on Route 9 in um, Natick. Okay. So all of that, all of that creates what I think we would call distress. And when it's about what's the right thing to do, we're talking about moral categories of questions. So it's m um, moral distress. And then this is the last slide I want to leave you with. Most of these definitions of moral distress, these historical, and I'm talking about going back to 1984, uh, that's the history, uh, really come out of the nursing literature. And the one that most people look at is the one from uh, Jameson. And he says, moral distress occurs when a nurse knows the right thing to do, but institutional constraints make it nearly impossible to pursue the right course of action. That certainly is a situation for moral distress, but I think it's a still narrow definition. Cinder Rushton, contemporarily, is a, a person at Johns Hopkins who does tremendous amounts of research on moral distress, moral resilience, moral courage. She says moral distress is a predictable response to situations where nurses recognize that there's a moral problem and substitute nurses for any healthcare professional nowadays and for family members and patients as well where uh, they recognize that there's a moral problem, have a responsibility to do something about it, but cannot act in a way that preserves their integrity. That's a moral distress situation. And then finally, um, this was a blog entry uh, it, two years ago that I, uh, stayed with me. Moral distress is the emotional state that arises from a situation when a nurse feels that the ethically correct action to take is different from what he or she is tasked with doing. They still follow orders, right? Most of us still have to work under the license of the physician writing the orders. So that is true as well for family members who are offered you know, a, a certain menu of options and they may want something else. They may honestly feel that something else needs to be on the table as well. And what do they do about that? These are all examples of what I call, and others call, constraint distress. That is distress from constraints outside of them that are imposed on them. And I just want to leave us with this, which I think is a more broad and better working uh, understanding of moral distress. It's more than dealing with constraints that may be limiting, distorting, changing, prohibiting the implementation of decisions. Moral distress definitions must be broadened to include and address uncertainty. What should I do? This is a pretty good slate of options. It's the only available slate of options. Of all of these things that I can do, what should I do? And then what happens when all of those sitting at the decision-making table can't reach either unanimity or even consensus? What happens when there's disagreement or outright conflict among family members, among team members? That's moral distress, and that happens. So we have with us this morning three incredible speakers, uh, the first of whom I am so delighted to introduce, Dr. Joseph Stern. Uh, you have his bio. I'm not going to reread it, but I want to tell you how I met him. Uh, I have only just met him personally this morning, but in the fall, and I think you've got it here or on the table outside, uh, I read an amazing article in the New York Times written by Dr. Stern and it told the story of how life-altering his care and, and participation in the end days of his sister was and 
it touched me profoundly. And so I spent a little bit of time trying to figure out how can I reach this fella? Now sometimes, you know, you read things and that's your reaction and you kind of start to look and then things fade and fizzle and sadly for Dr. Stern that didn't happen to me. I just was on this like, I don't know, meat on a bone. I was just going to find this man and see if he would be willing to come and speak with us today. And he was, I found him and he was willing to come and I'm delighted to present him. So we're going to hear the first of three stories today. Dr. Stern. There is a so, thank you very much for having me, MC. It's really an honor to meet you, and it was really lovely for you to have called me. Uh, and it's a funny thing how this all happened because um, she uh, contacted me on uh, an email. I, there was a, a way to get a hold of me after writing the article and said, Would it be possible for you to come and speak? It's like, There's no Speakers Bureau, there's no full calendar. It's, sure, <laughs> happy to do it. Um, and I am on a bit of a mission which has become sort of a, a course of personal transformation that I want to share with you about the experience that I had with my sister and how it has reshaped how I practice medicine and how I think we need to think about patients and how we need to render care. So I, um, this experience has changed me a lot. Um, and I'm, I'm delighted to share that with you. And hopefully at the end I've got a list of uh, sort of call to action which I think will be helpful in terms of explaining things that we can do better, things that I learned about myself about how to do a better job as a doctor and ways that we can all do better. I'm very humbled when I'm standing here and listening to everyone talking about nursing and palliative care because I feel that the neurosurgeon is sort of on the far side of technical and kind of um, expert driven specialty care and I would probably learn a lot more from you if I were sitting and listening and I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing the other speeches but there's a lot of collaboration that we need there's a lot of working together um, I want to thank MC I also want to thank Suzanne and there are four people in uh, Greensboro North Carolina which is where I'm from uh, uh, Angela Marsh, Jamie Goldberg, Joan Evans, and also Oren Miller, who helped a lot with putting this presentation together. I work in a hospital uh, called Cone, Moses Cone Hospital, which is in Greensboro, North Carolina, and I'm a practicing neurosurgeon. I have a busy practice. I um, co-direct a brain tumor, our brain tumor program and do stereotactic radio surgery, and then I do a lot of spinal surgery. I also do deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's and for tremor. Um, so I'm pretty busy uh, and, and I really love what I do. Um, I thought I understood, <coughs> let me see if I can get this to work. So is it just push this? Yeah. I guess, uh, yeah, on the right, yeah. yeah. Okay. So I, I thought I really understood a lot about uh, medical care and patients and compassion and um, when my sister got sick it really uh, changed my world and changed how I perceived uh, illness and how I perceived patients. So I want to talk, I've got three stories. The first is uh, my sister Victoria, then I'm going to talk about her husband Pat, and then uh, a, a dear friend of ours, Sue. So Victoria was my younger sister. She's 18 months younger than me. Uh, and she uh, was a remarkable person. I have some slides from her childhood, and this is not going to be a, uh, you know, like your summer vacation where you see a million slides. <laughs> but I wanted to give you some context, some idea of who, who she uh, was and also uh, about our youth. So this is my sister, and that was a familiar uh, spot. She was always looking and kind of very aware. Uh, she was always around. That's my, my mom, who is also in the audience today. And this is our older sister, uh, Caroline, who is very much a part of our lives. These are the cousins, all nine cousins, and that's the little one, and she was the uh, driver of our lives. Even though she was small in stature, she was very powerful. So when we were young, I was very introverted, 
And actually, this, believe it or not, would be one of the most terrifying experiences I could imagine as a kid, standing in front of a bunch of people and talking. And my little sister was, this was her element. This was what she was all about. She could, uh, she was an actress. She um, was uh, the life of the party. She was very generous. She would go to people and, and go up to uh, people who they didn't know and, and start talking to them. We grew up in England for four years. Um, and when we were in England, uh, she, we went to a, a Paul McCartney concert and she got me, we sat in the seat with, seats with a lot of other uh, famous rock stars and we got, she took me around and we got everybody's autograph. And she was not intimidated by anybody. So I was more science uh, oriented and bookish and she was much more um, of, the, of an actress and really a very good actress. This is when we were in, in France. I want to go back to this. This is, this is uh, we were um, in our, this is Victoria who lived with us and it was her wedding and we were in, uh, in the wedding. When we grew up in England, I was very bookish and science, I guess you would call it a nerd, um, very um, studious and she was an actress even then. She was starring in, in, in roles and uh, plays. When we came back to the US, she was the star of all the productions. I once decided I would try out for a play and I was cast as a courtier in a Shakespearean production and I had one line and she was the star. <laughs> and that was kind of how it went. When we grew up, we went our separate ways. So I went to University of Michigan and I went there for undergraduate training and then I stayed there for medical school and then I went and, and did residency there as well. I married my wife Catherine who is also here. So you see we're very excited. <laughs> my sister moved to Los Angeles, first to New York City then to Los Angeles and she was uh, a struggling actress and but per, was in Law and Order produced a, a, a movie and uh, also was a great counselor to others. She would have been a great agent. She was a great counselor and facilitator for other people's careers. So she married Patrick and they had two children. Here you can see them, Nick and Will. Here she is, this is kind of a, uh, emblematic of her as the queen uh, at, this, at a school function. I think it was Halloween, but she seemed quite uh, content in a crown. <laughs> and here's her uh, Screen Actors Guild. Here's a headshot from uh, some of her productions. One of the things I learned from her, and you know, I, she basically got sick and I found it very disruptive personally and I'll get into that in a few minutes but one of the things I learned from her is how utterly <coughs> difficult it is to audition all the time to always try out for plays to always try to get a, a role and I is as a neurosurgeon it's relatively easy there's a lot of uh, accolades and satisfaction you show up at work patients are happy to see you you always have work it's very different and now that I have been uh, I've written a book, which I'm trying to get published, which led to the article in the New York Times, which led to your call. Um, it's very difficult because I'm trying to get people to pay attention to something that I'm saying, but there's a crowded world out there. Why is anyone going to pay attention? Well, I think as I've gone on this journey, I'm starting to understand more clearly why what I'm talking about is really important because I'm talking about how patients are perceived, how physicians interact with patients, and the way we need to change how we practice medicine in terms of our orientation to patients. So from, for this, I thank my sister. Now, when I was, uh, while she was in Los Angeles acting, I was in Michigan. Here is a photograph from my residency program graduation. And these are, so this was my co-chief resident, uh, Steve Doran, who's in Nebraska. This is Sanjay Gupta, 
who you probably see a lot on the news, and he was one of my co-residents. He is a great guy, by the way, and he's been very supportive of my journey and what I'm trying to accomplish here. So these are just some photos of, uh, this is my daughter, Abby. We were, uh, this is at the wedding of my sister, so that's our son, Ben. This is our son, David. I used to have hair, it used to be red. <laughs> And this is my wife, Catherine, and our children. And now they're even more grown up. So we went our separate ways. Uh, I was, as a young child, different than my sister. She was very outgoing. I was very introverted. I developed what I would call, a, what, what I developed is emotional armor. As a physician, training, you put up barriers, you learn to keep your distance, you are compassionate yet reserved and somewhat um, distant. That was how I kind of, that's how I trained, that's how I, uh, the role models that I followed, and um, that actually, that armor became pierced. So when my sister got sick, I kind of, uh, lost that protection. So in 2014, my sister developed leukemia. Uh, so she was in Los Angeles and it started with a uh, flu-like illness and then she uh, ended up having a bone marrow transplant and then she later died. This is from her journal. She wrote a journal. She envisioned that she was going to beat leukemia and that she was going to uh, do a one-woman show about what it's like to get sick and get better. And so she wrote a journal. And this was the number of seconds that she had been in the hospital for during her illness. So a total of almost eight months in the hospital where she was, and I think there's, you know, a lot of illnesses are pretty challenging uh, in terms of isolating you. I think in many ways having chemotherapy which wipes out, wipes out your white blood cells and your protection is very difficult because she's a very much a people person and she was having to be on isolation, having to restrict the contact with, with, patient, with other people. <laughs> so this was from her journal where she wrote about how long she was in the hospital and her course of illness. When my sister was diagnosed she took the approach of, I'm going to get better. I am going to beat this. If everyone takes a little bit of chemotherapy, I'll take twice as much chemotherapy, and I'll beat this, and I'm going to be... And she was a remarkable patient. She, would, she did everything she was asked to do. She was nice as could be to all the staff. Um, but she was not willing to acknowledge the severity of her diagnosis. And she was not willing to accept the idea that she might die. The reason I put this up here is this is from her initial diagnosis. The medical term would be that she had what's called monosomy. She had a AML or acute myelogenous leukemia. She had something called monosomy 7, which is a loss of a complete loss of a seventh chromosome. And AML is all stratified based on your genotype, what is, what is the mutation that caused your illness? And her diagnosis, I remember I talked to her oncologist and he said, the first thing he said was, don't Google it. So of course I Googled it. <laughs> <laughs> and don't look at the uh, prognosis. And there's a lot of advances in the care of leukemia, but in the monosomy seven, it's one of the worst prognoses. So her initial diagnosis carried with it a 6% five-year survival, which is dismal. That's like pancreatic cancer and glioblastomas. I take care of people with brain tumors a lot. And that's a horrible prognosis. But she didn't want to hear that. She didn't want to accept that she might die or even what the odds were against her. She said she thought that if she 
admitted that or accepted that, that that would breathe air into that and that would become the reality and that by admitting that she might die, that would in fact lead her to die. And that's where I think it was a little maybe, I don't know, I say Los Angeles or kind of it's a different way of thinking. I really don't have that same way of thinking. And I feel that physicians and medical people are probably better suited to, because they have the training and the background and they're not afraid of the science to understanding this, but how you incorporate that personally and how you integrate the idea of, well, this is really not good, but I'm going to do everything I can to try to get better. I think that's a crucial step in terms of being ill. I think if you put up a barrier and you say, I'm not going to accept that I might die, you close down some possibilities. So this was in her hospital room. And one of the, uh, for those of you who have read the, the article, um, I arrived just as my sister was deciding that she was going to get her hair cut. She was tired of it all falling out, and so she had her head shaved. One of the things I loved about my sister's hospital experience was she turned her room, where she was virtually a prisoner, into a sanctuary. So she had pictures of her children all over the room, and she brought a lot of her home into that hospital room. And that was one of the things that I started to realize as a physician. We tend to dehumanize people. They come into the hospital, they leave their possessions behind, they're all put in gowns, they don't have their own stuff. You take away the things that define them as individuals and as people, and that's done in the spirit of uh, care. But in reality, I think what we're doing is we're making it less painful and for us. Because I think we don't, we don't want to see people as individuals. We don't want to keep them as different. We, don't want, we want to see them as patients. So here she is getting her hair cut. This was what she called her the stalker, which was uh, she had nine IV pumps running all the time. And she had to push that around in the hall. So this set of pictures was from before her transplant. So she was getting her conditioning treatment prior to transplant, where they basically kill your immune system and your blood cells. For the course of the year of her illness, it was a very, uh, it was like a roller coaster. And I became also aware of what it's like to be on the receiving end of care. I've always been the giver of care. So I make the appointment, I answer the phone, I respond to patients, but it's all kind of on my timeline. It's on my schedule. And suddenly I found myself sitting in her, ho in her hospital room waiting for people to show up, waiting for doctors to come, waiting for uh, answers. And that's agonizing. And the other thing I recognized was that it is an extraordinarily frightening thing to be sick. And it is an extraordinarily disruptive thing in terms of your life. So uh, part of the barriers that we put up is a desire not to realize that. Now part of it is you're taking suffering and you're dealing with suffering and you're making it somewhat routine in the sense that all day long I'm dealing with people who are frightened, who need surgery, who have problems, who have questions. And as you said, we're overburdened. There's too much going on. There's too much that I have to answer for. And yet, every patient should be as important as my sister. That's kind of the definition of being a doctor, right? You know, I should treat my patients as if they're my family. I should do what is right for them. I should honor them and, and uh, respect them and be as mindful and as caring of them as I would her. So one of the things that I felt, you know, this, this is, an, to me it's an interesting, how did I go from grief to needing empathy? What's kind of the through line? And I realized a lot of it is about fear. Is that I'm afraid, and in this article that I, went, that I wrote about a uh, patient, my first reaction was fear. Here is a young woman in her 30s who is dying of breast cancer. 
and has come to me for help. And the technical thing that I'm doing is relatively simple. I had to put a catheter into her brain to administer chemotherapy, but the reality was horrific. This is an end stage kind of problem. She wasn't likely to live very long. And so my initial reaction when I went into Megan's uh, examining room, and this is not my sister, this is the patient that I, I suddenly was able to connect with differently because of my sister's experience. I was initially afraid. And I think that as doctors, we tend to wall that off, to step away, to move away from the fear rather than acknowledge and, and then accept it. It seems wrong for me to say of my sister, well, she didn't want to accept that she was dying if I'm not going to accept that and discuss that with my patients. When I arrived in my sister's hospital room, you can see under the masks, you know, I was afraid. What am I going to find? Is my sister, I felt guilty because I hadn't really been that closely connected with my sister. Is she going to be upset with me that I really wasn't a good brother for a long time where we didn't connect as much as we should? And the thing that was great, and you can kind of see in this picture, under the masks, we're both smiling, you know? So by stepping in and by accepting, just showing up really, we reconnected, we reunited, and that was really a wonderful experience. And by my being willing to accept the fear and to move through it, I discovered something about myself. And I discovered that actually I felt better. If I had turned my back, if I said, oh, I'm too busy, I've got surgeries, I have to cancel surgeries, I really can't go there, you know, we'll talk on the phone, I would have done, I would have denied that compassion, which I think is crucial. So here she is in the hospital. So the first realization that I want to talk to you about is, is that here is my sister, the patient. Okay? She's like everybody else. She's in a gown. She's got her head shaved. She's getting chemotherapy. Uh, she's in the hospital. And here she was as the vibrant actress only a few months earlier. Very different. But here's the person that I knew and grew up and with and loved. I think love is the other part of this that goes with the fear. Is, and the thing is, this is every single patient. Every single person who comes into my life has a history and, you know, in, in this instance, common history with me. So that was the kind of first thing that hit me pretty hard when I started to recognize what is it like to be on the receiving end of care? What is it like to be a patient? What is it like to wait on doctors? What is it like to be deathly afraid and live with that for eight months? So my sister, we spent much of the first six months or so of her illness trying to get a match for her for her bone marrow transplant. And in the end, it turned out to be her son, Nick, who, who was the donor. That's a tough thing for a 15-year-old kid to have to do. And what's really scary is if it doesn't work, then do you feel guilty that you didn't do the right thing or you didn't save your mother? So this was the beginning of a personal transformation, which I'm underway. You're seeing it now. You know, I would never have gotten on a plane and come to Boston to talk to people I've never met. It just wasn't in my thing. <laughs> but I'm glad I'm here. So I was trying to figure out, well, how can I describe this? So when I was, um, after my sister's, uh, I guess it was after her transplant, I said, well, I don't really want to go away. But I had planned with my friends that we were going to go and climb Mount Kilimanjaro. And this has been kind of one of my bucket list things to do. Here is a view of the Serengeti in a hot air balloon at dawn. And it's beautiful. But the reality is really different. So this is the analogy I would give you that, that it was as if I went from seeing in black and white to seeing in color. That everything became richer, that I started to understand things better, and that I was able to connect with patients and with their experiences better. 
So I'll give you some examples of what that's like. What was I like before? Well, as a resident, I remember that I had t done a really interesting brain surgery on a man who had a very complicated brain tumor, and it was fascinating. And the biology of all this illness is, is incredible, and being under a microscope and removing the brain tumor was very uh, interesting, very challenging. But it was a glioblastoma, which means that it has a terrible prognosis, which means that despite all of the treatment that we can do, we're really not able to cure this. And I went out from the surgery suite and went to meet the family. And I went with my attending doctor. And I was tasked with talking to the family about what his prognosis is and what we discovered. And I was absolutely shocked because I walked into this room and there was a seven-year-old, a nine-year-old, a five-year-old child, a mother, uh, the entire family. And I couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. I said, well, we think it's not good, but we're waiting on the pathology. So I kind of punted. I didn't admit that it was a disaster. The surgery had gone fine, but we were not going to be able to cure this, and he was likely to die. I just couldn't do it. Now, maybe that was the wrong circumstance, and maybe they needed to, to absorb this over time differently. Um, but I just couldn't bring myself to do that. And I, and I regret that, because that was a missed opportunity for me to connect with that patient, and, or for that patient's family, and to level with them, and to tell them what was going on. So, flash forward to fairly recently, I had a patient who had been in a car accident, devastating car accident. He broke his neck and he had a bad brain injury and he was in a coma and he was not likely to live. Excuse me. And his mother <coughs> was standing by his bedside and I didn't know what to do and I just hugged her. That did more for that woman in that situation than any talking I could have done. So part of the transformation is that I allowed Victoria into me and for her spirit to change me. So I want to talk about missed opportunities. I think there were missed opportunities for Victoria in that she didn't ever accept that she was going to die. When she had an early failure from her bone marrow transplant. Her leukemia came back. What happened was her platelet count started to drop and they said, well, it could be drugs, it could be other things, but in the back of people's minds they were thinking, it's likely that it's leukemia that's coming back. And, it, and her platelet count kept dropping. And then they did a bone marrow biopsy and they found that her leukemia was indeed back. And the doctor did more chemotherapy. Well, let's change the chemotherapy. Let's try something different. And the reality was, she went from a horrible prognosis to a dire prognosis. She was not going to live. She never had that conversation with her physician. She never accepted it. She never said goodbye to her husband and her children. And to this day, her children are scared to death of hospitals. They don't want anything to do with health care. They're just horrified by the whole experience. I think I told you a little bit about some of the missed opportunities. I think that you look back and you say, what would I have done differently? What could I do differently? To recognize that suddenly you've been seeing things in black and white, thinking that you were seeing them fully and then recognizing, no, you weren't. There's a lot of missed opportunities. I could have done things differently. I could have connected more deeply with patients. I could have had more meaningful experience. But at the same time, I'm glad I'm learning. So I'm glad for the experience. So I don't, I would never wish illness on anyone, but going through this has been a powerful life lesson for me. 
So here's where the mission part starts, which is I recognize the impact that it's had on me, and then I start to look at how we're doing collectively. How are we really taking care of patients? Could we do better? And the thing that's interesting to me is I'm not a palliative care doctor, and I think the palliative care doctors are probably very good at taking care of patients and very good at understanding. So I'm talking to you, all of you. I think you already get it. I think it's the people who aren't in that world that it's difficult. And I think we need to learn more and understand each other better, understand our roles better, understand. You know, I think one of the things I'd say is that, is that in terms of the transformation, when I first started surgery, I used to think it was all about precision and perfection. So I, my goal was to do a perfect surgery and to be as precise as possible. Because there's a lot of burden, there's a lot at risk when you're doing neurosurgery. The, the margins for error are small, a bad outcome can be a disaster that can result in someone's death. And yet, as I moved through my career, I started to recognize that that's really not the goal. First of all, I've never done a perfect surgery in my life, and I never will. It's, a, it's an unattainable standard that we strive for, but I can't do it. The other thing I'd say is you're only as good as your last surgery. So every day starts again. You know, Every day, you start from scratch. But I started to recognize that it's really not about perfection. It's really about connection. That patients, what they really want is to connect with their doctor. They want to know that they are cared for and cared about. They want to know that they matter. And that took me a long time to get to because I'm always in the defensive medicine, emotional armor, making sure I'm correct. But you can be correct and soulless. And I wouldn't say that I was soulless, but I would say that I did not reach out, I did not connect as much as I wish I had. I was thinking another way to describe that, when I go to an examining room and I knock on a door and I step in, that's only the first of the doors that have to open, okay? You have to go in and you have to open the door to your patient, to your patient's experience. You have to open the door to yourself. You have to connect with someone. So a lot of times I think that we get so task oriented and so hung up on all the details of what we need to do, the electronic record, uh, doing prescriptions, writing notes, all of these things that we forget why we're really there. And I think when we say that we're going to, uh, oh, that people will say, oh, empathy um, takes time. I, I don't have time for that. It doesn't take time. In fact, it often really saves time. What it, what it is is that you have the willingness to go there, the willingness to admit that you don't know, the willingness to say that you're sorry, the willingness to cry. So those connections actually are like gold in a medical relationship because that's what people really want. Every one of us is going to die, right? There is no so the whole, out, the whole idea of like, you know, I put on my emotional armor, I go into battle, I slay the disease, it's a fallacy, right? We're all going to die. So what we really need is connection, compassion, empathy, understanding, and help making difficult decisions. But the idea that I would sit there and say, well, I know what's best, or I can do this, or I will save you, isn't really true. I mean, you can on a short-term basis on, in terms of disease, but you can't long-term. So I'm going to switch gears now and talk about Pat. So Victoria died. She went into the hospital and she died of sepsis. She, her leukemia was back and she uh, had an overwhelming infection and then her heart stopped and she had to have uh, CPR, which is sad to me because she wasn't likely to live anyway, so why do that to her? But she had never had a code status discussion, she'd never had advanced directives discussion, she was a young, she's 52 years old. You don't die at 52, right? So you don't have those discussions. Well that's a missed opportunity. So a year and a half later, Pat, 
who is uh, my sister's husband, father of Nick and Will. He was basically soldiering on, an amazing guy, took care of the kids, ran a business, he had five companies, he was a venture capital guy, smart guy, very successful in what he did. He was out for a jog with Nick. So here they are. He was out for a job with Nick and he collapsed. Excuse me. So he was always the one that everybody thought would be sick or not last because he had had two heart surgeries. He had a valve replacement. And he was on Coumadin because of his mechanical valve, which was the second valve that they put in. Unbeknownst to anyone, he had an aneurysm in his brain. So he had a hemorrhage from that aneurysm. So, kind of irony of ironies, Nick was alone with his dad, hears him vomiting and then going into a coma and does CPR on his dad. So they took him to the hospital and he went to UCLA, so a big medical center. And I flew out there uh, the next morning from Raleigh. And I spent about, I spent a week there and then I went back after a few days. I had to catch up with some work and take care of patients and then I stayed out there. And so suddenly I was again in this situation, but this time it was a neurosurgical catastrophe, which is the world that I live in all the time. So I was taking care of or advising the care of my brother-in-law who had lapsed into a coma and then had to have surgery to clip the aneurysm. Uh, and then we had to talk about end of life and withdrawal of care. And I was his healthcare power of attorney. So suddenly I'm living the life that we all dread, and, but I have all the training and I know what's going on. And it was again eye-opening. It was as if, you know, uh, scabs torn off and you suddenly realize just how sensitive all these things that we do, all of the processes and the grinding kind of um, uh, indifference, of seeming indifference of a hospital, of a big hospital. Um, and the people were very kind, so this is not a criticism of that hospital. I thought they did a great job. I walked in on Sunday morning uh, just as Pat was coming out of surgery. And um, doctor, his neurosurgeon was striding across the hall. We waited for him. First of all, no one told us when, when he would be out. Um, we waited for hours. We finally, I snuck up to the ICU to um, try and get some word on what was going on and this wonderful nurse came out and said he's called into surgery, found out he was in surgery, found out he'd be in surgery for five more hours, said go home, get some sleep, come back and we did that. So I met, so we were in the lobby and I knew kind of instinctively who the neurosurgeon was by the way he walked, you know. <laughs> and, and I said that's the surgeon and, and went to the, the uh, his, his brother and sister-in-law had also arrived uh, and we went to the doctor and said, um, you know, tell us what's going on. And he said, well, I clipped the aneurysm, you know, and aneurysm surgery is technical, it's difficult, it's challenging, it's kind of exciting. But I said to him, but that really doesn't matter, does it? And he took, what? what? And I said, he said, what are, who are you? I said, well, I'm a neurosurgeon. <laughs> and I said, you know, the getting rid of the aneurysm prevents another hemorrhage, but it doesn't reverse the damage that's been done. And he's in a coma. And he's not showing any signs of waking up. And so the conversation shifted. And suddenly he knew that I understood exactly what was going on. And he said, uh, you're right. And you know, what we should, we made a plan. What we should do is we should give him a week and see if he wakes up. And if he doesn't wake up, we should stop. But, and then he cautioned me, he said, but don't let them put in a feeding tube and don't let them do a tracheostomy. Because the problem is, once you're on a conveyor belt at a big hospital where it's all about length of stay 
and it's all about patient throughput, the humanity gets sucked out of the system. So I had a doctor telling me, warning me, don't let this happen. So then I would show up every morning and we would sit and listen to the rounds and talk to the neurointensivists and discuss what was going on and I would always remind the doctor, I said, but he's still not waking up. He's still not getting better. And it was also very painful, as you can imagine, to have to talk to the two sons and say, you know, you've lost one parent, you're about to lose the other. But this was another weird moment because I was afraid of that conversation and I was afraid of being the person who says, well, we're going to stop. We're not going to keep going unless we really see that he's improving. Because I knew Pat, okay? I knew that he was vital, ran five companies, toured the world, took nothing from anybody, was a very, very um, creative, um, active, passionate person. And I knew the worst thing that for him would be for him to end up in a nursing home in a vegetative state, knowing that he was a burden to his kids. And so then the thing is, here we go. We're talking certainty or uncertainty. Well, I don't really know. And there's the outside chance that he might get better, but the odds are stacked against him. So what do we do? So I talked to the sons, and I said, you know, your dad is not doing well. He is not likely to recover. And I think that if he doesn't wake up, we should stop and let him die. And I sort of braced myself. What's, what are they going to say? And they cried and they were very upset, but then they thanked me. And I was shocked. Why did you thank me? It's because I told them the truth. I was not afraid of telling them the truth. And in that process, I gained trust. They understood that I had his best interests at heart. And they agreed that that was the right decision, that we should stop if he didn't show any signs of improvement. So I went back to Greensboro to go back to work for about, um, for a few days, and the, and then he flew back to Los Angeles, and he hadn't woken up at all. So we had a conversation with uh, the intensivist. We had already, and finally we met the palliative care people. But at that point, all the decisions had been made. So it wasn't, it was like funeral planning. You know, they were very nice, but what I needed was all of that input earlier. And I feel sometimes that the treating physician doesn't want palliative care involved. They don't want to have that conversation until you've already decided all the tough decisions. And yet those are the people you need to be able to help you make those decisions. So, the palliative care people were wonderful, and there's an awful lot I had not planned or dealt with having to plan a funeral. There's a lot involved, and particularly when you're in a town that you don't know. And again, I started to understand the disruption. All these people come, dropped everything in their lives, come from out of town, come to this you know, crisis. It's very demanding. It's very uh, stressful. We were then trying to figure out well, where are the kids going to go? What's going to happen? So. We're sitting on the day we have decided that if we're going to withdraw care, that we're going to withdraw care, and the, uh, the intensivist gives me this talk, or gives us this talk, where he says, well, he might get better, and he might become, he's probably not going to be independent, but he might wake up. And I felt the rug being pulled out from under me, and I said, but I know the literature. I live this life. And I said, that's not really true. I mean, it is true. He might. He possibly might wake up. But he's not likely to. And the overwhelming likelihood is that he won't recover and that he will be very impaired if he wakes up at all. And I said, so I pushed back. And he said, yes, you're correct. And then we called the neurosurgeon, Dr. Lekovic, who's a great guy. And he came up and I said, look, you got to help us. We're really stressed out here. We have decided to withdraw care. And this other doctor is saying, well, he might get better. And that's undermining everybody. He said, no, he's not going to get better. We've done everything we can. He's not going to get better. So it wasn't, it wasn't 
certainty, right? It wasn't, um, it, was, it was connection and it was having some guidance from an expert who doesn't have all the facts, doesn't know everything for certain, but could help steer us. And that's what we needed and that helped us. And we let him go and he did die. So neurosurgeons are often the gatekeepers from like life to death. This is a lot of what I do. And I find that it is a wonderful job, but it is a very demanding job, as you might imagine. And to do, and to suddenly take on this whole s another layer and nuance, it's really a challenge. But it is also a really a great experience. So I'm glad, I love what I do. And I, I do love the connection that I can have with people. But it is a very daunting. So I want to switch gears and talk to you about Sue. Okay? So Sue was our friend. And this is her with her grandchild and her husband. So her husband, Bill, was my professor of neurosurgery at Michigan. And he, again, kind of like me, sort of nerdy, <laughs> good one-on-one. -on -one. She, kind of like my sister, very effusive, very engaging, inviting people, very connected to people. So I had written my memoir, which is, in it, in it is both my sister's diary as well, um, her journal, as well as my experiences and sort of my personal transformation. And then I interviewed a bunch of doctors because one of the principal things I want to say is that you've heard my story, okay? But we all have stories. Every one of us has lived this kind of thing. And so we are all connected. And yet, when we do these things, we tend to do them in isolation. We don't reach out and connect. We don't have, we, that's when we need the connections to be stronger rather than weaker. That's when we need to really reach out to each other because we all are going through these things. So Sue and Bill read my memoir. And they said, they, they were very encouraging. They said it was wonderful. They said it really helped them have discussions about end of life and all the things that I was talking about with my sister. And he invited me to come back to Michigan to give a talk at the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Department of Neurosurgery about what it's like to be on the receiving end of neurosurgical catastrophe. So I, uh, I talked about Pat's experience. And it was very well received. So this last October, Sue had a little abdominal bloating, little discomfort. And a week later, has an abdominal CT scan, and she has metastatic pancreatic cancer. So she went from completely normal to death sentence. I've got six months to live, at the most, based on data. She did not pull away from that information. She accepted it. But they also, and I think also the medical training helped them, they decided to take treatment. They would try to get better. So here she is at her granddaughter's dance competition in North Wilkesboro, North Carolina, where she won and won a $2,000 scholarship. And this is her in chemotherapy and you know she's wearing a wig but she's, you wouldn't know. She looks great. This is the other grandmother. This is Lily, the granddaughter. Sue had invited us in. We went, we went for uh, coffee at her house. And she talked to us about dying. I was able to sit and talk to her. What's it like to be dying? It's kind of a weird question. But she was very receptive to that. And we talked a long time about that. And because she talked about her illness, because she welcomed questions, because she allowed us to discuss it, and she also did the same with her granddaughters, very open about all of this, it really kind of took the ele elephant out of the room. And then we talked about all sorts of other stuff, fun stuff. So this occurred one day prior to her having a stroke. 
I was on call for neurosurgery and she had a subarachnoid hemorrhage as well as it's a little bit of bleeding as well as a stroke. And so I got called as the doctor now. And we talked and we said, you know, she was aphasic and she was hemiplegic. So she couldn't talk, but she was not in any distress. And we said, well, let's try to do an intervention. Let's try to remove the clot and see if we can fix the problem. And then she got momentarily better and then lapsed back again and uh, became unconscious. And at that point, her husband had her moved to a residential uh, palliative care hospice unit where they were wonderful and he let her go. So he was looking and saying this is what she would have wanted and she had a pretty good death. She was understanding that she was not going to be cured. She tried but then and she did and she lost consciousness so you know, with my sister, right up until the end of her life, she knew exactly what was going on. Pat was out of, was not conscious. She was sort of in between. You know, she'd smile, she couldn't talk, she couldn't move one side of her body, but she wasn't in discomfort. So I think that the, the, the help that she got from palliative care and from hospice was, was huge. So, this is where we get into the whole mission part, which is, I put, and I think it's in your packets, of, of kind of a call to action of what I think is important or what the take home, what are the take home points from all of this? What am I trying to get across? Why did I fly to Boston to come talk to you? So honest and direct communication with patients is essential. Don't finesse or avoid discussing the possibility of death. Emotional honesty, including tears, is a source of deep connection, power, and strength. You know, we talk about burnout among physicians, and every time you choose, or I, I think I kind of see a little bit more closely, personally, about burnout, every time I choose to back away, not to have that conversation, yeah, it kind of gets me out of the exam room a little quicker, but it's almost like a part of you dies because you don't connect with that person. You don't, you don't, and you try to stifle the emotion. You try to bury it and it doesn't work. And over time, that's very destructive. So I think it's much more helpful to face these things head on. I am a better, healthier doctor because of this. <laughs> Incorporating grief and going through it is healthy. Bottling it up defending against it or repressing it is not. While we may feel alone, we are not. We all face similar losses, often in isolation. Connecting with patients is powerful. So is connecting with each other. That's why this kind of thing is super important. <laughs> Treatments and technology can be great, but can become distractions. And I say this, beware the magic show, okay? Sometimes it's easier to keep the ball rolling and do the treatments than take a step back and say, are these really in your best interest? Is this really going to help you or is this going to hurt you? What's really the best thing to do? So I think that sometimes the treatment can become a, a way for everyone to avoid the reality they don't want to face. Physicians cannot do everything themselves. Medicine, particularly the care of the mortally ill, must include other practitioners and their perspectives. Palliative care needs to be involved far earlier in many cases. It certainly would have helped with my sister and my brother-in-law. And it's interesting, you know, palliative care doctors aren't burned out. So it's not the sadness, it's not the grief that's the problem. It's the unwillingness to accept it. The opportunity to give to others is a privilege. Enjoy it. Revel in it. It is enriching. It is restorative. This is why many of us went into medicine.
So empathy is the key to excellent patient care. It doesn't come from a system. It doesn't come externally. It comes from within. It's portable. It goes with you. You have it. You are willing to go there or you're not. It's not, you know, people say, well, can it be taught? And I think it can be taught. And I think what you can do is unburden people so that they're able to have more time to be empathetic. And empathy must drive care. Every single person needs to elevate the patient to the center of care and to truly assess and eliminate obstacles to empathetic care. Marketing and slogans can become corrosive if they're not supported by action. And I think this is a big problem. Billboards go up, you know, we care about you. That's not the same, right? In fact, that's actually not empathetic. That's the opposite. Everyone, including administrators and those not directly involved in patient care need to come to in close contact with patients, sharing in their experiences and those of caregivers. Decisions must come from this mindset. Organizations can only be empathetic to others if they are empathetic towards their employees. Empathy cannot be assigned as yet another task. Overwork, too many patients, too many duties, including EMR, squeezes employees and destroys empathy. Medicine is interview based, but we are not trained to do this well. Nobody taught me how to do an interview. I've learned through my career. Neither are we trained to manage the powerful emotions we encounter on a daily basis. This needs to change. Atul Gawande put in his book about how doctors need coaches. I think it's a good idea. I need continuing education. I need the, uh, to learn from my experiences. I need a safe place to go and talk about all these things and try to get some perspective. That's this. <laughs> so this is a simple test. And you know, it's kind of strange because a guy is standing up here talking about empathy and he's talking about um, how important or how central the patient is and it's almost like a platitude. People hear it all over the time but if you really take it to heart, if you really are serious about it, it's game changing. So a simple test. Is what we're doing good enough for my sister, my wife, my mother, hey, Mom. <laughs> me? If not, change things. So I want to give you some examples of how you talk, you talk about the personal transformation. I think in the past I would have been more cynical and I would have just said, you know, I can't really change things. I can't really have an impact. So I want to give you a couple of examples of how that's, I've changed and I, and I fight. A couple of them are insurance issues. One, we had a, a patient, I had put a, a deep brain electrode in for a tremor. He had previously been a maintenance guy at the hospital worked for the health system. He had a complication from the surgery where he had bleeding around the electrode. And that's a known complication. You know, the surgery went well, everything was fine. This developed after the fact. But he developed weakness afterwards. And he had the hospital, the health system insurance plan. And they sent him to a nursing home, despite the fact that the neurosurgeon, the neurologist, the rehab doctor all said he belonged on rehab. And then he came back a, f a few days later, a little bit worse, and I called the insurance company. And I said, he needs rehab. He's your employees, our family. And this is our complication, and we need to own it. And it can't be about money. It has to be about the person. And what was really interesting was I talked to the, the, insur the director of the insurance company. I was expecting a bunch of pushback. She was very grateful I had called. She said, thank you. I like hearing this perspective. I like understanding about what's going on with this patient. And they took him to rehab. Another patient, also an insurance issue. I had recommended back surgery. 82-year-old man. And he um, and the insurance company said no. And I said, I've been taking care of this man for, I called the director of the insurance company. I said, I've been taking care of this man for two years. We've done everything we can. He can't stand up. He can't walk. What in the world can I do with him? There's nothing else I have to offer. And I argued with him. And interestingly, the, the other guy who was a doctor went and reviewed the films, met with a radiologist, 
reviewed his chart, called me back and said, yeah, I see your point. We'll, we'll cover it. The problem is you get beat down because there's how many times can you get on the phone? How and that's why the teamwork's important. I can't do all this all myself. I can't fight for every single patient, and yet I have to. Another patient, this was a dentist that I did surgery on, and his daughter was uh, one of the high up administrators of the health system, and she didn't introduce herself. She didn't say who he was, and then the nursing care, she was appalled by the nursing care. She was very frustrated. They didn't bathe him, they didn't walk him, and so suddenly when you start to see what everybody else goes through, and this is why the, the administrators have to be involved, right? This is what you guys are, these are the ratios you're putting in place. This is the nursing availability, this is the task burden, and this is the, this is this, the situation that you're creating. You have to own it, right? And you have to be willing to change it, you have to start and, and if you look at that person and go, well, this is my dad, and he's getting lousy care, what are we doing to all these other people? Take these messages to heart. They could save your life. Thank you very much. Sorry. Go yeah. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Apparently, I went a little long, and we don't have a lot of time for questions, but I'm happy to answer any questions you have. And I, sir, I'll be here all morning if people have other things they want to ask. Anybody have any questions? Yeah. Did uh, Pat not have a living will? So he, interestingly, he did, and but he had it locked in a safe deposit box. <laughs> and so we couldn't find it. And so we had to make all these decisions and, and we had told him you need a living will. And part of this is he didn't want to admit that he was gonna, that he, like my sister, I'm never gonna die. But uh, we never found it. It was supposedly, it was in the safe deposit box and then we had to call the lawyer. And of course this always happens in the off hours and we couldn't find it. Yes. Uh, as a neurosurgeon, because there are other specialties, a uh, patient comes to you before you operate and they have a CAT scan for the families there. How many times do you, you look at something and you know exactly what's going to happen? More or less. And you say, okay, look, uh, this is your prognosis, this is what I can do, these are your complications. Can you please go back uh, home and think about it and come back and tell me? How would you like me to proceed? Be aggressive, be unaggressive, do something or not? How many times are you in that position before something happens and you operate that you, you know ahead of time what's going to be? I think sometimes it's complicated because you don't know for certain until you have a tissue diagnosis, but a lot of times you have a pretty good idea. And I think that um, uh, there's an interesting situation with a, a partner of mine where um, a uh, 85 year old man had what looked like a glioblastoma and he had said um, I you know I, I can which, she, he was asking me well would you remove the whole thing or would you just do a biopsy and then he added of course well if it were me I wouldn't do anything it's like well you gotta have that conversation right you know you have to you have to um, I think it's key that people understand the likely prognosis and that they are able to reflect on that and make an uh, informed decision. And I've had many patients, uh, one fairly recently, we did a biopsy, he said, we don't know for sure what this is, I think we should do a biopsy, I think that's relatively lo low risk, and if it turns out that it's like we think it is, then I would say don't, don't have radiation, don't have other treatments and go for uh, palliative care, and that's what they did. So um, I like the idea of um, giving people time and going home and thinking about it, usually we talk and kind of make a decision at the same time. Because um, usually there's some urgency to it. But I think that's very helpful. Yes? Do doctors get any training about these issues, like going through schooling or things like that? Is it, is it part of a course now in a doctor's training to look at the patient, to include 
uh, the family in the, in the discussions, uh, particularly when they get to end of life issues? So I, uh, that's actually something I'm very interested and involved in. And I've gone back to University of Michigan and uh, they have this program called the Healing Arts, which I'm getting involved in, where we actually talk to students and uh, get there um, and help them with that. But I also think that I trained back when doctors were handmaidens to, to nurses. And, <laughs> and, and, they, and so I'm from a different time. And uh, I think that training is improving, but I also think that it's not, um, it's not where it needs to be. Well, I, ha I had a horrible personal ex experience in, in the sense that my father was diagnosed with metastatic CA. The doctor told my mother and I, but never told my father. Yeah. And he said, well, I'll tell him. It took him three weeks. Yeah. He came down and he did tell him, and I couldn't understand my father's reaction. And I went in and I said, Dad, what's going on? Uh, he said, I didn't hear him. I figured you'd tell me I'm dying. So I had to tell my own, I wound up telling my own father he was, he was dying. He had three I, months to live. I think all those things don't really work that, I, the idea of like putting, telling somebody but not telling everybody because as soon as the rest of the family knows they can tell by your facial expression what's going yeah. on. Yeah. I mean, so you got to you got to tell everybody. I think a lot of that stuff this sort of medical paternalism is kind of hopefully a thing of the past. And you do involve people in discussions and decision making a lot more and some people are very reluctant. They say like you're the doctor, just tell me what to do. It's like no, we're not doing that anymore. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jeff. the world um, doing uh, consulting in healthcare, law, and ethics, and communications. And I never had an office. I always met at whatever was the um, Chi Chi coffee bar, or, or <laughs> local Starbucks, or you know, the convenient dunks, which I love, and which were around the world. But in any event, that's how Mary and I first crossed paths at the Starbucks in Needham, uh, where we were talking about palliative care presentations in her parish and collaborative. And uh, so when I later was thinking about, I learned things about Mary at that conversation. <laughs> <laughs> when, I was, when I was later thinking about uh, things, uh, colloquium, uh, re uh, re regarding the colloquium, I thought, oh my gosh, have we got somebody that I need to have on this program? And that would be Dr. Mary Buss, who is the co-director, or the section chief director of palliative care at Beth Israel Deaconess, now Beth Israel Leahy. Lord only knows next year what it will be <laughs> in this ever-changing healthcare world that we occupy. But um, Mary is an extraordinary woman. You can read her biography and her bio sketch rather in your packet. So I won't spend a lot of time on this, but um, it's always wonderful to leave an encounter with somebody you've never laid eyes on before and walk away with this kind of great person impression, and that is the impression I had with Mary. That was only underscored when I heard about her mother, and God bless her, I would love to meet her mother, but I can't. Mary is the only friend slash colleague, really almost total stranger, probably from her perspective, but I call her my friend, um, whose mother is in a cloistered community of religious sisters. How many people here can say they have a friend whose mother is a cloistered nun? Right? So uh, it is with tremendous pleasure and a little bit of humor that I introduce you, Mary Buss, and uh, please welcome. Thank you. Do I need both of these mics? Okay, yes. just making sure. Um, so I'm out of the closet with my mom as a cloistered nun. Um, it's a, a good community to be out of the closet with that about. Uh, I was in line this morning and heard someone say to one of the sisters who's here, oh, sister, go ahead, I won't argue with a nun. I was like, well, wait till your mom becomes one. <laughs> so. Uh, I'm very excited to be here. I said to MC when she reached out with this uh, invitation, I said, well, this will be really good for me because it's challenging me. I, I'm odd, unlike Dr. Stern, I actually am happy to get up and talk in front of people, which my mom, the cloistered nun, is still astonished by. Um, although she is the order of preachers, which I have to <laughs> remind her sometimes. Uh, and I, say, I said to her, um, this will be good because 
the faith piece of my world is not something I spend a lot of time uh, talking about in public, and so I think this is a good challenge for me. So I thank you for inviting me here to do that. All right, let's see if I can get this to work. So my outline today is a, to start with a story, not quite as personal as the ones that we've heard, but I do feel like stories are such a wonderful part of what we as um, clinicians get to do and really kind of what make the work I do just fun. Um, I may say, maybe I shouldn't say it's fun, but it is fun. Sometimes it's certainly meaningful and fulfilling. So I'll start with a story and then kind of use that as an offspring to talk a bit about defining moral distress, think about topics that commonly are causes of moral distress in the clinical setting, and kind of dig into that a little bit deeper, and then think about why is that happening, what are the drivers of that, and then sort of switching that into what we can do to mitigate that, because I think there's some very clear tools of things that we can do to, to change the way we practice, and I think that that can really have an impact on um, moral distress. And then I'll finish my story, and hopefully there'll be some time for questions. So my story is about Clyde, and Clyde is a gentleman. This is not his real photo, because Clyde was African American. Uh, and I met him on a Friday afternoon, about 3 o'clock, right about when I was thinking, maybe I'll get home in time to have dinner with my kids. And the pager goes off, and I get a consult. I'm wearing my palliative care consultation hat. Um, from the, the surgical ICU, which is not a place that calls palliative care very often. And they, I happen to be nearby, so I go over there, take a little time to look at the chart, and then walk into the room. And, and this is pretty much what his room looks like, right? So this, this parting of the ways of the technological um, barriers to actually get to the bedside to meet Clyde, who is on a breathing machine and hooked up to lines and tubes. And what struck me about Clyde is that Despite all of this technology, he's visibly in pain. He's got a furrow on his brow, and he just looks really uncomfortable. And I slip out and said to the nurse, you know, help me understand. Like, it doesn't look like he's used anywhere near his allotted amount of analgesia. Why, is, why, why are we allowing this patient to be in pain? And she says to me, I can't give him any more morphine. <laughs> Uh, it lowers his blood pressure too much. So let me back up for a moment. Clyde walks into the hospital 29 days before I met him from home, 93 years old, with acute abdominal pain and is determined by an x-ray to have a bowel obstruction. And so a tube is placed down his nose to drain fluid, standard procedure. Uh, doesn't work. So two days later, he goes to the operating room on hospital day two and has a benign or non-cancerous cause of a bowel obstruction. And he goes back to uh, recovery after that and spends about 10 days not recovering. So hospital day 13, he goes to the OR a second time. He has, it's called a lysis of adhesions. And he leaves the operating room with an open abdominal wound. Two days later, he goes back to the OR a third time for a planned revision. On hospital day, I think 18 or 19, he has a patch placed over his abdominal wound. He has a feeding tube placed on hospital day 21 because he's been on a breathing machine that whole time. They take the tube out of his mouth and put a hole directly in his trachea. He has percutaneous tracheotomy placed. And on hospital day 29, palliative care is consulted. And so in summary, Clyde has had everything that medical care has to offer, except pain control. Moral distress, anyone? <laughs> so this is our healthcare system, and I think the thing that's most disturbing when we really think about it is that there's probably some version of Clyde in every ICU, every month, in every medical center across the US. And in my hospital, there's, I think, 12 ICUs. So this is happening all the time. But we can change this. So just to kind of orient us to moral distress, uh, MC kind of defined this for us, but I like this kind of reversion of it by Father Lamberton. This is actually from the National Association of Catholic Chaplains website. 
Um, and he talks about moral distress as a psychological disequilibrium and painful, like truly painful feelings that result from recognizing an ethically appropriate thing to do and not being able to do it, right? So simply put, moral distress, we know what the right thing to do, but for some reason we can't act upon that. So the nurse that was taking care of Clyde, right, who can't give him pain control, can't um, alleviate his pain or suffering. So what are the common causes of this in in my world, right, in taking care of patients who have advanced illness. The clinical causes of moral distress are listed here. It's actually from that same article. And I've highlighted a few that are sort of relevant to either Clyde or to are common, I think, in advanced illness. So continuing life support when not in the patient's best interest, right? So one could raise that question with Clyde at hospital day 29, being on all of the support and a breathing um, machine this whole time is this really in the patient's best interest? Do we know what he would want? Um, not so true for Clyde, but the question of initiating life-saving actions that merely prolong the dying process. Um, then there are issues of sort of inappropriate resources or stewardship, which I'm not gonna get into as much today. There's the question of inadequate staffing, um, where we all feel like we are too busy um, and there's unfortunately good reason for that. But I'm going to emphasize the other piece, which is this inadequately trained staff. And I think we heard some pieces of that from Dr. Stern's talk, right? That this is not something that is given um, adequate attention in medical training. And I'm not sure it's true in the nursing or social work training as well. Um, and lastly, inadequate communication about end of life, especially with families. So it's hospital day 29. Clyde's been there for a whole month. The family is not in the room. And I can't tell from the chart how much they've been there. And so there's not clear documentation that there's been numerous family meetings. So I have no idea what his family really understands about what's happening with his care or what his sort of overall prognostic picture is. Um, then there's issues about following families' wishes based on fears of litigation, which I hope is less common than this issue of following patients' wishes because patients are grieving or families are grieving. Um, and there's this concept, this last thing here about providing false hope to patients and families. And I would say in my world, that really is never, very, very, almost never done intentionally. Right, it more comes out of my role as a clinician, the more I know my patient, the more I, I'm faced with a conversation when I'm wearing my oncology hat and trying to figure out should this person get another line of chemotherapy and I offer the spectrum of well it might go this way this is kind of the worst possible outcome and this is the best possible outcome but I really want the best possible outcome to happen and so that is unintentionally overemphasized and the family potentially leaves with this idea that it's much more likely than it really is um, and I think that's the piece where false hope can come into play and then finally, this concept of providing inadequate pain relief, which is certainly something we saw in Clyde's circumstances. Um, so this was a, another article that I think looked at some of the things that start to drive moral distress and how that may be different among different professions, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, so this group, which is actually from Germany, uh, looked at the prevalence of moral distress among physicians and nurses who are taking care of patients with oncologic diagnoses. And this may not be in your handout. I'm a bit of a last minute slide tweaker, so my apologies. Um, so they basically looked at patients with cancer diagnoses who were going to undergo a decision for life limiting treatment, where they were gonna to have to sort of stop doing interventions and surveyed the physicians and nurses involved in their care using the moral distress thermometer, which is just a zero to 10 scale as to whether or not there's a presence of moral distress. And they said that this was highly prevalent. So 67% of physicians and nearly 80% of nurses said that they had moral distress in the care of these cases. Now, interestingly, the median level of distress was two. So when I do a pain score, two out of 10, like that's good. I'm moving on to something else. So one could argue whether or not the, the moral distress of, of two is, is as clinically relevant. 
That being said, the author sort of said, we shouldn't have any moral distress when taking care of these patients. And so anything above a zero is clinically relevant in this care. And I think there's a case to be made for that. So what was curious here is that even though the median is the same, that nurses have more moral distress than physicians based on this data. And then when we look at the satisfaction of these decisions to limit treatment, you can see that nurses are less satisfied with these decisions than doctors. And I think we probably can kind of guess why that is, right? The doctors make the decisions, so they want to, they're going to say they're satisfied with them. Um, but the other thing I thought was really interesting here is sort of what's driving the um, incidences of moral distress in these patients. And so one thing that was really clear is that for nurses, the primary driver of moral distress is the patient's quality of life. And so the nurses are the ones that are at the bedside and really experiencing what Clyde is experiencing or what these other patients are experiencing. And so the level of the patient's suffering, their burden, um, their limitations that are impacting their quality of life, that's driving nurses' moral distress and doesn't have any impact on the doctors. Um, so we should think about that for a while, right? And then if you look at these other categories here, um, the doctors are more concerned about if they have a different opinion than their colleagues. That's a driving factor. Both nurses and physicians are concerned about the ethical aspects of things. When you look at the communication pieces of things, um, the nurses are what, where that's the concern is, right? That they don't feel that there's adequate communication about what's happening with patients to the patients, to the family, to the nursing staff, that they're not involved in this, pro this process. And then the other interesting thing here is at the bottom, the thing that was the biggest driver for doctors was whether or not nurses were involved in the decision-making process. Um, which again raises some pretty disturbing questions, right? So is it that the nurses know how the patient is feeling and that they are in tune to the patient's quality of life or suffering burden? And then that when they're involved in the decision making, the doctors are now aware of that and that's driving some of their moral distress. Um, or is it us physicians in security so that once we actually invite the team who's involved to take uh, and taking care of patients into this process that we then are a little more um, conflicted because we can't just make the decision and forget about it. Um, so these I thought were some sort of interesting things looking at what might be different drivers of moral distress depending on discipline. There are also a lot of um, qual uh, qualitative information that I thought was interesting here. So what are the themes of moral distress? So one of them is timing. So you know, this first one is what I would have suspect expected. And of course, this is my world as a palliative care um, doctor. We should be involved sooner. We can be more helpful if you call us sooner. And so this kind of goes along with that. You know, treatment limitation, high palliative situation was not discussed with the patient early enough. Instead, chemotherapy was offered. That being said, there's uh, distress on the other side of this equation too. The decision was taken too early. Chemotherapy could have improved the patient's life in terms of time and quality. I had a meeting yesterday with the head of our bone marrow transplant program, and one of the things that he conveyed is, you know, we have to be careful. Several, one of our patients in the ICU was made, quote, CMO, one of my least favorite expressions, right? Comfort measures only, nothing only about comfort, um, because of the flu. <laughs> Right, that the 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 ICE, in his perspective, the ICU team didn't appreciate all of the other cancer-directed therapies that were options for this patient, where they could potentially benefit from. Saw just how sick they were, knew they had a serious underlying cancer diagnosis, and transitioned to comfort-focused care because of the flu. That was his perspective. There's the truth is probably somewhere in between, right? But the idea from a physician standpoint that there is an option that could make a huge difference that might allow a patient to live substantially longer or might substantially return their quality of life, no doctor wants to be the one that deprives their patient of that opportunity. And so I think that's a huge driver in these decisions to do things that have potentially low likelihood of benefit but can work. And in the world of oncology, that's happening more and more because there's incredible new treatments that occasionally can work exceptionally well. So other issues of moral distress. We talked, MC talked about the theme for patient autonomy. Sort of, I grew up you know, in the, the ethics of my undergraduate training and medical training, like patient autonomy was king. Um, and, or maybe it should be queen. Um, so, you know, these are issues that 
to me are just part of the healthcare system I grew up in, but I was a conscious of weren't necessarily true of the healthcare system that predated my training. So though when general health was very poor, the patient was still dialyzed, still got antibiotics until death, he received no information about decisions. <coughs> but here's the one I found most distressing. The patient was not seen by the persons who make the decisions. Shame on us. How dare we not see our patients in order to make these decisions? I have a friend and colleague who's an ICU doctor and has taken the practice of going into patients and recognizing that sort of the um, dehumanizing aspects of the ICU, the gown, and talk to uh, the family of this patient and sort of said, you know, well, sometimes it's helpful for the team to see pictures of this patient so that we have some idea of who they are. And she walked in the next day, and the entire room <laughs> is wallpapered with photos of this patient, their family, and just how you know, incredibly different that made the care of that patient. And then the need for communication, which we sort of touched on with that earlier data, right? So lack of communication between physicians and nurses. Um, <laughs> and that we as caregivers are neither involved in decisions or sufficiently informed about the result. And again, as was mentioned before, like healthcare has to be a team sport. We have to be involving everybody in order to make the best possible decisions and give the best possible care to our patients. And so if we think about ultimately what is, instead of the definition, but I think of what really is more the essence of moral distress, I really think it's about suffering that doesn't have meaning. I mean, as trite and as, as simple as it sounds like, most of us go into healthcare to help people. And that's certainly true for me. It's true for most of my colleagues that I know. Um, and so if we look at this patient who's in, his suffering and we can't help them, we can't do something about it, we feel morally paralyzed, that's, that's really morally distressing for us. And that part of what we need to do in order to mitigate moral distress is trying to figure out, one, how to reduce suffering, but second, also sometimes how to make meaning of situations that can be incredibly difficult. Um, and in my world as a person who takes care of patients who largely are facing a fairly limited life expectancy, I see examples every day of people who make incredible meaning out of situations that can be incredibly difficult. And it makes my job inspiring. Um, so why does this happen? Why, how in the world can we let Clyde's situation happen? How can we possibly do everything and somehow ignore pain control? Um, well, I think this is, there's a number of reasons for this. And so I realized, I don't know why, but I didn't realize until last night that Dr. Stern's a neurosurgeon and I'm putting up data about neurosurgical training. Um, so please pipe in, <laughs> correct me where I'm wrong here. But I, one of the things I get to do working at um, a Harvard affiliated hospital is that I get to meet people who are incredibly smart in the course of their training. We joke about how you know this year is the best and brightest class that we've ever had, which means those of us who graduated a few years back are way less smart than the people coming in. Um, and so as a result, we get to work with these incredibly bright, energetic people. And so I got to meet Stephen Miranda, who is was a medical student at the time, is currently a neurosurgical resident at University of Pennsylvania. And he was really interested in, in something about palliative care, so we connected on that. But he was also really interested in looking at moral distress. And so he surveyed neurosurgical residents and asked them a number of things, but I'm going to share with you the data about moral distress. And so of neurosurgical residents who answered this, you know, 63% of them saying, I have moral distress during my residency training. And then he asked, have you participated in operations and worried whether surgery aligned with patients' values? And the majority, 87%, said yes. Which begs the question a little bit, like why didn't 87% of moral distress? <laughs> um, so this is really, really common, right, in medical training. And so he then presented people with a scenario of a patient who's frail, somewhat demented, in his late 80s and on a blood thinner and has fallen. So he's found down and he's obtunded. So he has you know, right-sided paralysis and is not um, functioning. He's neurologically essentially devastated. And this is his uh, imaging, which basically shows he has blood in the brain 
that is, and then here's where I'm on um, um, narrow ground in terms of my neurosurgical expertise. But you know, there's blood in the brain, and if there, nothing is done about this, he is going to die within hours to days. And so it raises the question of should a neurosurgical procedure be done, and, and can that actually help prevent this um, neurosurgical devastation in this patient? And so this, pre this case was presented to these residents, and they were asked to recall a similar scenario, which they pretty much all agreed this was a familiar thing that they deal with. And they were asked a couple of additional questions. I'm going to ask, so, you know, the one I want to focus on do you feel the patient's care adequately reflected his or her goals? And 58% said yes, 11% said no, and 30% said I don't know. But why don't they know? Maybe they weren't the one involved in the decision making. Maybe they're the intern answering the survey and the senior resident had the thing and they were just called into the case. Maybe they didn't think to ask until we asked them this question on this survey. Right? So the idea that there are surgeries being done and that the patient's particular goals and values may not be inquired about prior to them getting brain surgery mm. is possible in our healthcare system. And then asked whether or not a recommendation for surgery was made, 43% of the time said yes. So I think, you know, surgeons do surgery. That's what they do. They're really, really good at it. Um, the fact that less than half the time these folks went to the OR, I think, speaks to how challenging this particular clinical scenario is in terms of whether or not surgery is, quote, unquote, the right thing to do. But here's some comments that I think are really illustrative of the moral distress of these medical trainees. Fewer people will question you if you do surgery. So surgery is the safe answer. A lot of neurosurgeons operate on the assumption that operating on 10 people is worth saving the one out of 10 people who will do well after sustaining such an injury. So is that the right thing, that 90% of the time you do something that's not going to work, that's not going to help? But 1% of the time it can make a difference, and how dare I be the one to deprive the one in 10 people who could actually benefit from it. Right? I mean, so you can see why this is a question that this can be morally challenging. And then the second, in general, the attitude of our program regarding having to talk to families about end of life issues is to get someone else to do it. <laughs> I.e. palliative care, please call me, I'm happy to help you. Um, but that this is, from that person's perspective, not something that they own as part of their job. Right? So they have the technical expertise, and yet it's not my job to actually talk to the patient about the ramifications and implications of the technical thing that I will do to you. And I think traditionally that is very much the, way, the unspoken message that has been sent in medical training. So other comments, the attending pushed for surgery. While I was of the view that this was not along the patients and families' wishes, if the prognosis was better explained to them. So this is a big thing in my world as palliative care, right? If people really understand what's going on, they make different decisions. And so we really need to help our patients and families understand what's really going on so they can make the right decision. So if they think this is just one little surgery and I'm gonna come out of that and two days later dad's gonna be the way he was before, they're gonna decide something differently if the outcome is much different than that, right? And then this last issue, we're constantly pressured by grieving family members to perform treatments that are largely futile. So this sense of I don't know how to have this conversation I don't know how to tell this person that no matter what we do, right, in my cancer hat, no matter what we do, this cancer is never going to go away. And that your time, because you're 48, is a lot shorter than it should be. And I can't fix that. I wish I could. So how do we make that time the best it possibly can be? Surgeons aren't taught how to do that. So when you ask these residents, how comfortable would you be performing surgery, you see a lot of discomfort, right? So these totaled up as half the, sur the surgical residents are uncomfortable, another 25% are on the fence, like three out of five. And you know, partly that's appropriate, they're in training, maybe they should just be not 100% comfortable doing surgery. 
But part of that, I think, speaks to the moral distress of this particular procedure that they're being inquired about. And then we look at the data here about what are you actually trained to do. So when I talk to, to uh, when I teach communication skills, I often take the vantage point that a communication educational experience is a skill, which is different than uh, in medicine, if people know this, right, the surgeons are surgeons, the medical docs are fleas because we don't do anything. You just kind of know a lot of information. And so surgeons are taught procedural skills, so they arguably should understand how to teach communication skills much better than medical subspecialists because we don't do, I certainly don't do procedures. Um, and yet, when you ask whether or not surgical residents are trained in, edu uh, educated in communication, here's what you see, right? When, it's, when they're asked about shared decision making, ethics and end of life decisions, leading a family meeting, managing opiates, so managing pain medicines and critical care, back to Clyde, communication about death, prognosis and critical care, or even the risks and benefits of intubation. And so how often are they seeing patients who are gonna go on a breathing machine? Like they do surgery, every patient's put on a breathing machine. And yet, well under half of them are ever trained to actually talk about any of those things with their patients. So how can we possibly expect them to do it well when they're not trained? Well, maybe they're not trained to do anything, right? Medical training, see one, do one, teach one. Not true. So this basically shows you that if you look at a craniotomy, which is, you know, to be fair, the bread and butter of neurosurgery, if they don't train how to do this, like, we're really worried, right? How well are we trained to do that versus how well are we trained to discuss withholding of life-sustaining treatment in the dark bar, right? So you can see the practice on the top. They, they talk about both of those things a lot. They get observed doing craniotomies almost as often as they do them and they get feedback frequently on the craniotomies that they are observed. But if you look at their practice having these conversations and then their observation and feedback, you can see that they don't get the same amount of observation. They don't get feedback. And so they're doing these conversations in isolation and they don't know if what they're doing um, works. And there's another slide I couldn't find I wanted to show you. Physicians are terrible at assessing their own communication skills, right? So if you look at a plot of physicians who say, how good, how well can I communicate with patients? And then you look at patient's assessment, zero correlation. Okay, so we don't know what we don't know. And we've got ego, so. You know. So then you ask, and this kind of speaks to that too, how, how prepared am I to discuss withdrawing or withholding life-sustaining treatment in the ICU, right? So we just showed I don't get, no one watches me do it, I don't get any feedback to do it. 95% of me, I'm prepared, I can do it, no problem. Yet, do you think you would benefit from more communication training? And almost half of these surgeons said yes. Right, so if they're really that prepared, they shouldn't need more training. So I think this is a little bit, bit of that, you know, we, we're reluctant as docs to acknowledge what we don't know. So how do we change this? How do we make this different? And that is where I think there's a huge opportunity for education in all of our medical residency training, and that is happening. It's very different now than it was even when I was in training, and I know when I was in training it was different than it was 10 years before that. And a big piece of that is, is doing palliative care. Some of that subspecialty palliative care, a lot of that is palliative care education or so-called primary palliative care. So what is palliative care? I, I'm I know I'm preaching to the choir largely here, but just um, bear with me for a moment. Um, we still have an identity crisis, right? Palliative, people don't know what palliative care is. So 70% of Americans surveyed a few years back are, quote, not at all knowledgeable about palliative care. So my mom, I love her pretty much understands what I do for a living. <laughs> Not always, right? Um, but much more disturbing, right? So in that, there's an opportunity, but much more disturbing. Um, because if my patients don't know what palliative care is, they have no idea, they have no preconceived idea, so they're not, there's no stigma. So I get to define it for them. That's a great opportunity. I, and people, I walk into the room and they're like, what, what do you do? H how do you say that word? Um, I'm like, okay, good, they have no idea. So I can say to them, I'm here to help you live as well as possible with your illness. 
whether it's cancer, whether it's advanced heart failure, whether it's the frailties of being 80 some years old. Um, and that means different things for different people. The problem is that the rest of my colleagues who aren't palliative care physicians believe that what I do is end of life care and they believe that's all that I do. And so, as was mentioned earlier, palliative care isn't called in until all the decisions are made. And then honestly, there's not a whole lot for me to do. Mm -hmm. And so here's where our work is, to get our colleagues, to get the non-palliative care medical professionals to understand what it is that palliative care really does, how it is that we can be involved, and what the opportunities are when we get involved earlier. So how do we talk about this? You know, palliative care, specialized medical care for patients with serious illness. We focus on providing patients and families with relief from pain, symptoms, and the stress of a serious illness. The goal is to improve quality of life. When I, when people sort of ask me what I do, they're like, well, what is that? You know, what are the three buckets of what I really do? Who, why do people call palliative care? And number one is for symptom management. We get called for pain, for nausea, in the hospital for delirium, sometimes anorexia, depression. That's pretty straightforward and that's pretty easy, right? It's easy to go in and say, your doctor thought I could be helpful in managing your pain. Most people aren't going to say, no thanks, see you later. <laughs> um, the other piece we get called in is psychosocial and spiritual support and that is why palliative care by definition is a team sport. It requires an interdisciplinary team, right? So we have on our team physicians, nurse practitioners, nurses, social workers, chaplains, there is no question that I am the worst at this category of all the folks on our team. Um, and there's actually data that we pulled that showed that. Um, <laughs> but fortunately, I knew that to some extent and got those other folks on the team, right? So doing this counseling, um, the support for the patient, the support for the caregivers. And this is an area where sometimes people are like, I'm good, I don't need that. Right? I'm sure all the social workers in the room are familiar with the people who don't think they are needed. Um, and so that's the second book. And the third thing that we do is what I've labeled here as decision making. This is the area that's the muddiest and the messiest and the most satisfying when you actually get to do it right. So these are the things about prognostic awareness. What, do these, what does this patient really understand about what's happening? And, and P.S., let's make sure we don't automatically assume their lack of understanding is because the doc didn't tell them. I was in the room on Wednesday with a patient who is um, in his late 40s and he has metastatic kidney cancer and I sat through a discussion with his oncologist and he was convinced, the patient is convinced, that if you just gave me the right antibiotics, doctor, I would be fine. I'm really frustrated that you don't have someone in your health system who understands sinusitis because if I didn't have to take the expired antibiotics that really help my cough, I wouldn't be in this scenario. Meanwhile, his liver is, I, I heard the oncologist literally catch himself starting to say the word exploding um, and reword it to your liver lesions are much larger and he has a massive amount of disease in his lungs including lymphangetic spread. And so, you know, had I not been in the room when the oncologist was telling him about his concern that, you know, we're happy to give you antibiotics, but we really think the main thing going on is your cancer, I might have thought, gee, they didn't tell him that, right? This patient didn't want to hear it and is really, really hoping that it's just a cold. And so then my task was to say to him, I really, really hope it's just a cold too and we're happy to give you antibiotics. I'm really, really worried it's something else and I think it's really important that we prepare you for that possibility and give you the best possible care for your situation now, which, which ultimately is you know, home-based care with hospice, um, and that if you get better, and if it is just a sinusitis, which I hope it is, we can discharge you from hospice, you can be a hospice graduate. Um, <laughs> and we'd be very happy about that. But you know, these are the conversations that can be really difficult because patients don't always understand what's going on. And some of that is where they are and some of that is that we as physicians don't do a great job communicating about this. And so the issue with palliative care is end of life care, right? Is really that palliative care is brink of death care. So think about Clyde, right? So 
Clyde walks in, and he's old. He's 93. P.S. He'd never had an advanced care planning conversation. Another story. Um, and so he walks in the ER, and he's super sick. I don't fault anybody for putting an NG2 down. I don't fault anybody for taking him to the OR the first time. But what about the second time? Or the third time? Or what about when you were thinking about putting the tracheostomy, right? That once you're on that train, once the, tra the pe peg and the trach have been placed, it's like hard to then take them away. <laughs> if you don't talk about what they might do or what they might not do before you do it. So huge amounts of missed opportunity along the way. And that Clyde's case is like basically pretty healthy and then he fell off a cliff. Most people have a lot more warning, right? They have underlying heart failure. Amazing to me that you can tell a patient they have heart failure. Doesn't mean anything to them. They're not worried about the fact that they might die even though their heart is failing. Tell me of cancer, different story, right? Oh my gosh, that means I could die. That actually makes my job easier, right? It gives an entree to these conversations. So lots of missed opportunities along um, disease-directed therapeutics where we can say we can do this a second time, but when it comes to a third time, you know, we might need to think about whether that makes sense. Um, and so what we're working toward is an integrated model of palliative care that every patient at the diagnosis of an acute or serious illness has palliative care integrated. Never going to be enough of us for that. So that means that we need to train up everybody else to be able to address some of these issues in that context. And that palliative care gradually becomes more and more what's being done, right? That the chemotherapy I'm giving is palliative intent. We hope it helps you feel better. We hope it helps you live longer. It's not going to cure things. And so that when it's time to talk about hospice, it's a more gradual transition and not so much of a falling. Our adults will die without decision-making capacity. And so we've heard stories today, right? Clyde is in no position to make this decision for himself. But certainly when he walked into the ER and had been functional prior to that and reasonably healthy, like why wouldn't you take him to the OR the first time? Right, so that we need some guidance for his family to help make decisions when you come down to the second and third trip to the OR. So 30% of adults die without it. And then when you ask patients, right? When you ask patients about their advanced directives, when I'm really sick, when I'm at the end of my life, 90% of people make some decision and will document some decision to limit treatment, right? They don't want everything. And so if we don't ask, 90% of the time we will get it wrong. We have to ask. And so if we ask, they're more likely to get care aligned with their preferences and they get higher quality care. So starting this conversation makes huge differences for the care that people get. Um, so why doesn't it happen? I mean, I think this kind of sums it up, right? My advanced directive was for you not to show up. <laughs> right? To talk about dying in our culture is kind of countercultural. So one thing that we can do about it is kind of improving our education and improving palliative care. And so how do we do this? And here's my challenge for all of you, I think most of you are in healthcare, for ways that you can start incorporating um, this work into your practice, if, and you're probably already doing this, but other ways to do it. We have to find out what matters. And this is really what makes the work so meaningful, right? Is that we understand our patients, we understand who they are, we find out what matters to them. There's two questions that I'm going to encourage you to start asking patients. And anybody can ask this question. Given your current state of health, what's most important? Okay. Not what do you want. Think about the code status. Have you heard these code status conversations? So in the event that your heart stops, would you like us, do you want us to do chest compressions? Nobody in their right mind wants chest compressions. Right? They want to live. They want the outcome. They're, under, they're willing to undergo a lot for an outcome. So given your current state of health, right? So whatever that is, given that you have a serious diagnosis, given that you won't live forever, what's most important to you? Given that time may be short, what matters? And then the second question, when you think about your future, this really should be a two-part question, what worries you? But the flip side of that, when you think about your future, what are you hoping for? 
when you ask people these questions, right, you might start with stuff that doesn't seem important and you just keep asking. So they say, what's most important to you? And first of all, when I ask that as a doctor, a lot of patients are like, what are you asking me? <laughs> That's not what I thought I was supposed to talk to you about, right? So they don't know how to answer that question. What do you care about? Um, but you ask and say, well, well, what else? And they start to talk about their family. <coughs> or they start to talk about their cats at home. Or they start to talk about a, an event, a bar mitzvah, a graduation that's in the future. Um, and they almost eventually get to something that you're like, oh, we can do that. Right? We can make that happen. We can't get them to the graduation of their grandchild who just turned two. Um, that's not going to happen. But we can almost always get them to something important that matters. And then what worries you? What are you afraid of? What are you scared about? Give them permission to have that conversation with you. It makes such a huge difference in their experience of the healthcare system and such a huge difference on how we de dedicate their care. So if we introduce palliative care, I also think there's this language. How do we talk about this? Um, so palliative care provides a layer of support for people with serious illness. The language here is usually extra layer of support. I've deleted that. I don't think we're extra. I think we're essential. And it's a layer of support. The team focuses on controlling symptoms and the stress of having a serious illness. Palliative care helps people live as well as possible. I consider them a larger part of the team of people who will help me take care of you. I feel like it's really crucial in my job that what we do is take care of patients. We take care of patients, but we also take care of the providers. Like part of what I see, the most important work we do is that we can support the oncologists, the surgeons, the heart failure doctors, so that they can make these decisions and feel good about them and give them permission to have these conversations. And then we need to do some work just changing perceptions, right? Oh no, they're not ready for palliative care, right? They're not ready for this. I often promise that I will take off my black coat and my sickle when I come see your patient, right? <laughs> And then we need to move toward, you know, palliative care is about living well. And then I think the last tool that we have, and this is something that I think we all share in the room, right? I didn't really appreciate how much faith informs what I do until I was taking care of a patient with my uh, attending. I was in my training. She was the same age as me within like three months. She's African American. I'm white. I'm like working at Harvard, so I'm in a pretty privileged position. And she has cancer diagnosis. And ironically, I took care of her as an oncology fellow. I switched institutions, and she fired that institution. And she comes to the institution where I did my palliative care fellowship. So I see her wearing this different hat. And I remember telling her as an onc fellow, like, your cancer hasn't gone away. Like, you're gonna, in fact, she told me. She's like, you told me I would be dead in six months. I was like, I never said that. Huge lesson. Like, I don't know exactly what I said, but she remembered my conversation in a way that I would have never dreamed. So, like, the, our words are incredibly important to our patients. And so she recurs. She goes and sees the oncologist at this other institution, and they. I talked to the oncology fellow, and I said, "What were you? You know, she's got pain. She's limping. She's using a cane." And he said, I said, why did you keep her? Like, you're going to be a breast doc. Like, you only keep breast cancer patients, right? Like, you're not even going to do rectal cancer, which is what she had. And he's like, I thought she was cured. He really thought she was cured. And, and it used that lens that actually meant that all these symptoms that she had were complications of treatment and didn't really, and as a tending, like, they were so convinced she was cured, they just didn't think that was the issue. So then she recurs. And she has the worst pain course of, like, top five of my career, patient's pain, okay? So 20 years later, I'm still thinking about her. And so she comes in one day, she's a 13-year-old daughter, she comes in one day having contemplated taking all of the pills, and I've given her a lot of pills because she has a lot of pain. Um, and she's like, I can't do this anymore. I'm in bed, I'm in pain all the time, this isn't working. She's contemplating suicide. Um, and her 13-year-old walks in, Kind of, see, I don't know if she sees her with the pills in hand, but you know, and the, and the patient realizes at that moment, oh my gosh, I can't do this, right? 
So she's admitted and she's on, you know, she's got suicidal ideation, so she's on suicide watch. And one of my attendings is a psychiatrist as well as a palliative care doc. I'm like, perfect, she can see this patient with me because I know she's not suicidal anymore. I can avoid the psych consult that I don't think is necessary. And we go in to see this woman and she gives, as I think only African Americans can, this like amazing testimony of how grateful she is to be alive. That you know, she realizes how lovely her life is, that she has this 13-year-old daughter, that she's alive, there's all these good things in her life. And I'm like, your life sucks. <laughs> like you're gonna die. You've had some of the worst pain I've ever seen. And all you can talk about is how grateful you are and how much God has helped her see this and how important faith is to her. And I'm like practically in tears, just amazed by the sort of Southern Baptist testimony style thing she's given. And I walk out of the room with my attending and she's like, wow, that faith thing is really something. <laughs> I was like, so she doesn't have that, right? All of the suffering that this person's having that so many of our people have is put into context based on the fact that there's life after death and that if you want to make meaning of suffering, we have examples, right? There's no greater example than the one that we live our lives around. And so that all of what we do in terms of putting faith into context, at least in my world, un, kind of unwittingly is done through a faith lens. And so we have an enormous, I think, advantage over people who don't have faith in terms of making sense of suffering and making meaning of hell. Um, and we have an opportunity to connect with our patients on that level, which I feel like is something I'm still learning how to do. But so many of our patients share that faith and if that we can allow them to know that that's a, something we have in common, there's often a really meaningful connection that can occur in that context. And so we'll circle back to Clyde. I met Clyde on Friday. His family wasn't around. And he had a lot of family. Um, so over the weekend, the family was sort of called in. And on Monday, there was a family meeting. And as luck would have it, our nurse practitioner was on service, so I, I can't take any credit for this. But she met with the family, sort of sat down with the team, explained what was going on. And the family said, well, in that setting, you know, he wouldn't want this. And he, um, was transitioned from you know, the interventional care and the machines and the treatments were withdrawn and he was permitted to die comfortably and he died shortly after that. And so that's the end of Clyde's story. But you can see in his story all the opportunities for us to potentially have done things differently, to have done things better, and all the ways in which we can help other patients in his circumstances. And that was, um, I don't know if people are familiar with Deirdre um, Shara. She's an artist who does work in fabric. She did this um, work here. And she, I think what she does so beautifully is she takes people who are older and takes people who are dying and makes them beautiful. Uh, I think so many people see death as something scary and, and ugly. And yet she, her work I think really demonstrates the beauty that can happen there. So just a few take home points. This moral distress, witnessing suffering without meaning and without being able to alleviate it. And that we have the power as people who are in the healthcare system to change the way our healthcare system does stuff so that we can make meaning and that we can mitigate this. That caring for patients at the end of life is certainly an area where moral distress is common. And some of that I think is appropriate, right? It gets us thinking and that we have some tools for mitigating this. So one is educating providers in these palliative care skills and potentially practicing with some of those questions. It's thinking about palliative care, understanding what it is, using um, the palliative care um, team that you have access to earlier, and that also our faith is a huge way in which we can um, make sense of what we do. So I thank you. I think there's some time for questions. Yes. Could you just briefly discuss some of the more
world of stress that goes on when um, palliative sedation is um, suggested for a patient. That is something that yeah. I find brings up a lot of moral distress um, yeah. at end of life. Sure. So I'll repeat the question. Um, so the question is, can we discuss the moral distress that occurs when palliative sedation comes up, which is a great question. So first we need to make sure we understand what palliative sedation is. And so palliative sedation is the you know, patient has serious um, symptoms and the idea is that, so say they have pain and we've done everything we can think, right? So we've given them pain medications, we've given them IV versions of medications, we've maybe done procedures or epidurals to deliver pain, like we've really tried very hard to tackle the actual issue, whether it be pain, whether it be delirium. And despite us doing everything, we have failed. Right? And so that this patient is still in severe distress from pain or some other physical symptom. And you know, when patients are in that much pain, like there's no there's no way to make sense. I mean, you, know, you can't have a serious conversation when you've got whatever it is, you know, bony mats throughout your spine that are just constantly causing agony. And so palliative sedation is brought up in saying, so the suffering is unmitigated by tackling the actual issue under, and causing it. And so we don't want to allow this person to continue to suffer. And so we will sedate them using medications, recognizing that the medications aren't. So if you use benzodiazepines, which are commonly used and sometimes barbiturates, um, that this patient will no longer be able to interact meaningfully, like you, you eradicate their consciousness um, in order to prevent their suffering. And so when I was first presented with this as a palliative care fellow, I was, I was kind of horrified. I was like, I can't do that. That's, that's not okay. I'm not killing anybody, you know. Um, and it took me a couple different cases to see what was going on and to, and to really be thoughtful about it um, to come to a different conclusion. So. First of all, the data is pretty clear, and then there's not super data, but when they've done case series of patients undergoing palliative sedation, they don't die any sooner than one would otherwise expect them to die. The average life expectancy after initiating palliative sedation is about 72 hours. Um, and so the goal of this is not to hasten death. The goal of this is to mitigate suffering. And I think the intention of the act is cr in, critical when we think about the ethical or moral implications of the act, right? So we are not trying to speed up the dying process. We are doing this as an intent to alleviate suffering. And when all other attempts to alleviate suffering by tackling the direct symptom are okay. And so in that, using the principle of the double effect, right, the intent is to alleviate suffering. The known potential consequence is that maybe their life will be shorter even though, as I said, the empirical evidence doesn't actually show that to necessarily be true, but our intent is not to, to hasten the dying process. And as a result, it is on firm ethical ground to do palliative sedation. Um, I would say, having practiced now for over 10 years, you know, it happens less than once a year in my institution, so it is not something that we're doing all the time. Um, and I think the indication, and I don't know if I want to get into this, but the, you know, there's different indications, right? So some are very clearly for physical symptoms, and then there's a sort of issue of existential distress. And, and my response to that is, so that's not my area of expertise. That's where I get my chaplains in. Um, because I don't feel like it's my responsibility or my purview to sort of determine how to manage someone's existential distress. Um, and so that we really need a team approach when, when those things are coming up. Yes? I'm curious to know, as a, as a palliative care physician, when does the team decide that it's time to transition the person to hospice or the person decides that, is it when they decide that they want no further treatment or do you mm -hmm. wait until it's really down the road and it has to be evident at the end of life? So good question. The question is when you're, when you're following a patient who, with a palliative care perspective, right? So palliative care is following this patient. When do you decide to transition them to hospice? Um, and so I think one of the clear distinctions, right, is what's the difference between hospice and palliative care? And so one, just to be clear about that, right, so one thinking is that, a little oversimplified, but palliative care is a both and, 
right? So you can have cancer and continue to get chemotherapy and get palliative care, right? So people can still have active disease-directed treatment, still come back and forth to the hospital, still hope for cure, right? Like there's a 5% chance of cure with acute leukemia. I can be seeing that patient from a palliative care perspective. Right? And they can get cured and I can be super happy about that and, and no longer be needed. Um, so it's a both and approach. And that hospice, so I think two things are distinctly different about hospice. So one, hospice is constrained by the Medicare benefit. Right? So the Medicare benefit, back when it was created, I think in 83, one of the worries, which I find ironic, it would be used too much and it costs too much money. So we only want to give it to certain people. So they've limited it to patients who have a six month life expectancy. So there's two things you need for hospice. Right? In order to be on hospice, you need to have one or two doctors say that if the disease follows its normal course, the expected pro prognosis is six months or less. Purposely worded, right? So you can be wrong. Right? So CMS does realize that we can't tell the future really well. Um, and so I've done this. I've had patients on hospice for about 15 months um, and didn't get in trouble because they just live longer without chemo than they did with, well, probably would have with it. And so they need to have a six-month life expectancy and they need to embrace a philosophy of care focused on comfort. Right? And so hospice, because it gets reimbursed such a um, paltry amount, I think about 160 bucks a day, you can't afford to be giving disease-directed therapy and hospice. And so there's, the hospice gets, unfortunately, a little bit of an either-or. And so when you transition from palliative care to hospice, it is usually at a point when disease-directed therapy is being stopped. Um, so sometimes, so the, the patient I saw on Wednesday, it was very clear to all of us that hospice was what made the most sense for him. He is not ready, right? He still wants disease-directed therapy. Um, but he did say, one of the things he said, which I thought was a little bit of a, a wedge maybe for, for us to kind of get in, was it was so, so difficult to come into the hospital, right? So the other thing about hospice is that 96% of hospice is delivered at home. Palliative care is, is largely delivered in, in a consultation model in the hospital. There are increasingly home-based palliative care services, so that di divide is being bridged. But most of palliative care is inpatient consultation and then clinic. So you have to do well enough to come see me in clinic. And if you're too sick to come in, then we should go to you. Right? And so when I talk to patients about transitioning to hospice, I say, well, they're part of our team. And so they can be the eyes and ears for our team, and they can come see you at home, and they can assess your pain, and they can tell me what's going on, and then they can call me, which they do, um, and tell me, here's what's happening with you know, Michael, and here's how his pain is, and I'm wondering if we can go up on this or adjust that. And so I get a set of eyes and ears on my team that I trust to go, and they're not necessarily really on my team, right? They're on a hospice team. It's a different organization than my hospital. We don't own a hospice. Um, but they're part of the larger healthcare team, right? So they call me, they tell me what's going on. So I get to reach out to you through the hospice team, the nurse and the social worker, and evaluate you in your home, and you don't have to make the commute into Boston, which is a big ask. I hope that answers your question. Yes? Um, my moral distress comes from the gray area. If Clyde were 50, it's not so easy to make the decision. Mm -hmm. Where do you go for that? How, how do you get the confidence in your decision that this is the time to pull the stakes? So that's a great question, right? So Clyde's story on one hand is a good story because it feels like it's all weighted in one direction, right? At 93, we expect that people have thought about the fact that they maybe could die. You can't really assume that, actually. Um, but at 50, it feels really different. Right? At 50, we can really hope. I mean, I think that, um, I thought Dr. Stern's example was actually incredible about that, right? You had a 50-year-old who was incredibly vibrant and healthy and then had this horrible neurologic devastation. And what you find is that not everybody completely agrees about the outcome. So his outcome may have been weighted as like a 90-10 a or a 95-5 or a 99-1, so it'd be easier. But what about the scenarios where it's like 60-40 that you're not going to do well? It's gray. And I think that we need to, one, em embrace that and be good with it. And then we need to go to our patient and family and have them guide us. 
right? So in these conversations, I'm trying to think of a, a, a good example in my own clinical life um, to share where this would make sense. Like there are times when people come to me um, and the stakes aren't as high, but for chemotherapy, and there's a 50% response rate or a 40% response rate. And I don't really have a strong feeling about whether I think they should or shouldn't do more chemo. And yet, they come to me for a recommendation, right? It's not my job to say, well, you can do chemo A or chemo B or a clinical trial, or you can go you know, and do hospice. Go home, think about it, tell me which one you want, right? That's pretty poor care if I've left that decision on the plate of the patient or family. And so what I do in those scenarios is like, help, help me understand what you're thinking. What are you hoping to get out of chemotherapy? What are you, family member, hoping will happen with your loved one? Um, and so, and what is the quality of life that matters, right? So the patient I saw on Wednesday is a marathon runner, right? And so he ran with metastatic kidney cancer through his lungs. He ran like a 13-mile half marathon in Disney with his with his 13-year-old kid. Um, his li his quality of life is being active. And so, you know, for someone like him, I say, so this procedure might allow you to live, but you're then going to be in a rehab, and you're going to be on a feeding tube, and you're going to have several months of that, and the best case scenario, you won't actually come back in with a combination complication, but most likely you'll get a pneumonia and you'll wind up back in the hospital, um, and so you're going to have this really long course and you may never recover from it. Like, is that something that you would tolerate and be okay with? or not, and, and, and some people can tell you really clearly, look, if where I am right now, the way I feel right now, what I can do right now, if I can't be independent, if I can't go back to my own home, if you're gonna put me in a nursing home, like these are the things that matter most to me, I don't wanna live a life where I can't do those things. That allows you to say then we shouldn't go down that path because the overwhelming likelihood is you're gonna either not live or you're going to end up with a quality of life that is completely different from the one that you're telling me you care about. And then at other times we have to accept a certain ambiguity. I think the other thing you do is a time limited trial, which was also talked about, right? We're not sure how this is going to go. If it's not better within three days or a week, right? As long as it goes not getting better, the prognosis gets worse. Like I think we get stuck in this gray zone, right? Like, they're not absolutely dying and they're not getting better, it's, we're stuck. And I think the reality is as long as people are not getting better, that prognosis is worse, they're getting worse. Because if you haven't resolved from your delirium or you haven't recovered from what the other thing on day two, <coughs> that prognosis is better than if you haven't recovered at day seven, and certainly is better if you haven't recovered at day 14. I, I hope. I mean, I know that doesn't totally answer your question, but I think what you just described just um, kind of shows how it's important to get involved earlier, because you can't figure all that out and support mm -hmm. the patient and family with all that decision making. And age right. really doesn't matter. I think sometimes we get hung up on that mm. because everyone has a different value of their life at different. I mean, there might be a sixty-year-old who feels like their life has been fulfilled and they've done what they if, wanted and they don't. If I could interject forward. right about here, yeah. these are really important questions and issues and Mary, you're answering them spot on, but I would also encourage people to come in October, which is when we do, mm. um, we call it the Train the Trainer workshop, but it's really a, a couple of hours where what we teach are church teaching on these very mm. issues. So this notion of burdensomeness, which is a totally subjective um, mm. uh, kind of parameter for deciding how much more aggressive to be, how much more supportive to be, et cetera, in ongoing clinical intervention. That's that's handled beautifully. Mary got at some of it with pain medication with the uh, principle of double effect, but this other notion of burdensomeness, which is defined entirely by the patient or the resident in long-term care, as to what is acceptable, the church gives us tremendous guidance about mm -hmm. that, but then tremendous freedom about defining that way in the way that makes sense to us according to how we live our lives, what our values is, what our faith has taught us. So those kinds of teachings, coupled with the other point that you made, Mary, which is so important for those of us who sit in our faith community, and not I appreciate that not everybody here does, but this is the second last stop for us. You know, we, we firmly mm -hmm. believe in a life hereafter. 
and that there is there is a way to make that transition and generally it's by clinical deterioration, right? And how we determine that and how we, we make the decisions that support that and are supported by our faith are part of what we talk about in the October meeting. So um, for people who are interested in these ongoing and more in-depth discussions about church teaching on this, please do join us in October. There's a time, right? Yes. How do you actually start an inpatient palliative care and instruct, because we don't have, have one mm. at our hospital. And, mm. and the way it goes is somebody comes in, they get the three days for Medicare, then they're sent out to short-term rehab. Mm. So how do you, in that situation, develop an inpatient palliative care, and when does the doctor know that's a huge question. And it's our last transition. So the, the question is, um, so you, work, you work in a system that doesn't have a palliative care program, and so how do you start one? Um, certainly not something I can answer in one minute. I mean, I think part of the question is, like, you, we're working in a system where um, there's lots of potential value for palliative care in terms of the quality of life for patients and the quality of life for caregivers and staff. We're also working in a system where we have to pay the bills and healthcare is not very lucrative. And so there's the, what I would refer you to is the Center for Advancement of Palliative Care, which is abbreviated CAPSI, um, and that is their mission, right, is to help hospital systems develop palliative care programs and to make a financial case for it. So it turns out, unlike so many other things, that the palliative care is kind of the triple win, right? We improve quality of life of patients. There's actually some data that we may improve survival, so they may live better and longer because they, maybe because they get less interventional treatment. And we save the healthcare system money because patients are going home and having care with hospice and not coming back into the hospital. Or they're making decisions saying, well, gosh, if this is as good as it's going to get, or if my time is really short, no, I don't want to be in an ICU on a breathing machine. I mean, most people, when you ask them, you say, if you know you're dying, do you want to be in the hospital on a breathing machine? And the answer is, no, I'd rather be home. I'd rather die in my sleep. Right? Overwhelmingly, that's what people say. The problem is we never know. right? When you come at it prospectively, people are uncertain. So if you want to start a palliative care program, and I think that's, that's a big conversation. Um, part of it may be examples of stories where things have gone very terribly wrong um, that staff are powered up by and jazzed up by and then sort of presenting that there is an opportunity for us to do this differently, to do this better, and that it actually can pay for itself by reduction of length of stay in the ICU, reduction of length of stay in the hospital, and avert, um, avoiding hospital readmission. So there is actually a financial case as well as a sort of moral and clinical case for it. So I think we're good on time, but thank you very much. I'll be around the rest of the morning. If you think this is easy, it isn't to follow um, Dr. Stern and Dr. Buss. Um, I'm slightly overwhelmed by all the information I've even heard, and I'm trying to think about changing my whole talk, but I'm not going to. Um, Thank you to MJ and to Diane and to Suzanne who were very good in guiding me to this day and um, supportive. I'm going to use notes because I don't want to get distracted and I don't want to go off on any kind of tangents, but I did expand the story to include my dad and my husband who also had um, illnesses. I'm Fran Hauk. I'm a daughter, but now actually I'm an orphan. I'm a wife, but actually now I'm a widow, and I'm a mother of four. Probably they wish I was a cloistered nun, but I'm not <laughs> any given day. I'm a mother-in-law to three and a grandmother to, uh, to ten, the youngest of whom is five months old, and I'm currently nannying him. So the Good Shepherd Home in Springfield, working with adjudicated delinquent girls and their families, Nazareth Child Care Center, working with abused, neglected, or abandoned children for my early work experience. I learned about zeal for the soul from the Good Shepherd Sisters and special care of the poor from the Daughters of Charity, 
who, by the way, just had a mass last week. They're out of the Diocese of Boston now. They introduced me to support networks and to types of families that were very different than the family that I grew up in. Stellar mentoring by them sort of got me to where I am today. It formed a foundation and a lens through which I can see other than what I knew and enforce the emotional armor that Dr. Stern talked about. In those days, in the 60s, we were taught boundaries and we were taught you don't get into people's lives and we were taught strong at all cost. I didn't work for 12 years when I had my children, but that's really not true. I worked harder than I ever worked before. <laughs> Anyone who has kids knows that. It seemed to be a non sequitur to me to go out to work and take care of children and leave my children. So our lifestyle was different, certainly, than my own children's lifestyle today. We didn't go anywhere. We didn't go on vacations. We didn't have a lot of money. And the kids actually complained that they didn't have a key to get in the house because I was home. So go figure. You can't win, but you lose. For the past years, I've been a pastoral associate in a DRE at Holy Name Church in West Roxbury and work part-time at Brigham and Women's as a per diem chaplain. I also do some continuing bereavement education for the diocese. So I've been privileged to hear many, many stories. And everyone's story is so different and so compelling. It was only a couple months ago when I was asked to talk about dementia and the effects of dementia on a family that I even thought about sharing my story publicly. Our family knew it. But no one else knew it because I didn't feel they needed, to knew, they needed to know it, nor would they care to know it. Talking about my mother stirred a lot of memories. Thinking about this morning stirred even more memories of my dad and my husband. Alzheimer's is a terrible disease. Cancer is worse. Mesothelioma is whatever. And those were the things that got piled into our family. I continue to pray every day that these dreaded diseases, none of which have a cure really, skip a generation so I don't get it, or skip every generation. And sometimes when I don't have anything to do, I think, would I rather lose my mind? Would I rather not be able to move? Would I rather, would I rather? Don't get into that kind of funk because it is a funk. <laughs> Today, looking back at my father's and my husband's final health journeys, has resurrected more feelings. Alzheimer's is a long goodbye. The good part is there's plenty of time to say goodbye. The bad part is it's difficult to grieve a continuous long grieving for someone who's no longer the person that you knew. I've cried literally buckets of tears for my mom, for my dad, and for my husband. And years later, as I think of their final goodbyes, I keep thinking of what I wish I knew then and what I wish I did. And I hear other families saying the same thing. It's easier to say, never should on anyone, which is one of my, my lines in bereavement, than to live that way. I wish I knew that no one is immune from one sort of family issue or another. Working hard, taking care of your health, and being a good person doesn't immunize you from suffering. Having a deep faith and positive feelings about health care does not immunize a family from wondering if what they did or what they didn't do was the right thing. In bereavement and in death and dying workshops, I repeatedly underscored that feelings of if only and regrets and I should have get in the way of moving forward, of repositioning your loved one in your life, and of being able to go on with life. Intellectually, I understand that. I understand that if only focuses too much on ourselves, not on the person or the situation. However, my heart and my experience is with my mother and the progression of her disease still leaves me with some if onlys. My mom was the oldest of 12. 
She was an inveterate family lover. She loved her family of origin. She had 11 brothers and sisters. Three of the youngest were my sister's age. So I used to wonder, who does she love more, them or us? Sort of, it felt like she loved them better. She loved my dad, who took care of her. My sisters and I and her grandchildren were her world. Her big complaint was that she waited a long time to get grandchildren. She must have passed that on to me, because so did I. If only we knew that when my mom's personality began to change, it was a signal of something. A social worker, a director of nursing, and a career counselor. These are my sisters and I. We must have chose not to see. If only we knew that ignoring symptoms wouldn't make them go away. My mom was irritable, yelling. She locked the door when I came in. They lived in Western Mass, by the way, and we lived in Boston. Then she'd fall asleep, and she'd wake up, and she'd say, Fran, you're here. Thank you so much for coming that long way. And she'd be so nice to the children, particularly my two youngest, who she had just thrown out the door. Since I lived in Boston, I didn't see the day-to-day -day changes with my mother and thought that, you know, she was just off or she was depressed because her own mother died, by the way, when she was 74 years old. So that's a long time to have your mother. Dementia was not so well known and spoken about in those days. And if someone had someone who was not right, which is how our family would describe it, they wouldn't talk about it, for sure. It was a shame in the family. We weren't the only family that didn't recognize what was going on. It's not uncommon for families with loved ones in the early stages and symptoms of dementia to be blind to what's obvious to other people, hoping the symptoms will go away or trying to convince ourselves that we're just reacting or it's just a phase. This attempt to cope by denial and we all know denial is more than a river, may have made things easier in the short term, but it certainly doesn't help things in the long term. Admittedly, my sisters and I missed many of the signs or refused to address them. But consider my dad, who was her day-to-day -day caretaker. We weren't complete idiots. My dad colluded and conspired, I swear, with my mother. I walked in one day when he was taking pills out of her pill holder and putting them back in the bottle. He had rheumatoid arthritis. It was not easy. I'm like, Daddy, what are you doing? He's like, I don't want your sister to know your mother won't take her pills. I'm like, oh, okay, there you go. I'm sure he compensated for her because he wanted to protect her and he wanted to protect us. And sometimes I think he wanted to protect her and himself from us. My daughter Liz was in high school when she did a little uh, survey or a science project, how color affects memory, and she was going to do it on my mother. So you're supposed to look at a picture and remember the pictures that were in technicolor and the pictures that weren't or whatever. My mom couldn't remember anything. It was startling, and even a 15-year-old realized she better stop this test. She said, Bachi, don't worry, a lot of people don't remember these pictures, that's why I'm doing this test. If only I said something then, or called a family meeting, or called her doctor. But I played the game too. So my father could continue to do bingo on Friday nights. I went, I made a point of trying to go every Friday night. Listened to my mother, saw her fading, but still didn't do anything. Mentioned something to one of my sisters once, and of course she said I was overreacting. So that was the end of that discussion. The woman who would hop in the car, buy a bag of groceries, bring them to my house like we were paupers, just so she could play with the kids. She happened to be in the neighborhood. She lived in South Hadley. I lived in Roslindale, seriously. <laughs> but she loved being with us. She couldn't go to the neighborhood grocery store without getting lost or getting escorted home by the police, and it broke my heart. Each week, the drive back to Boston was filled with ambivalence. I hated her for how she yelled and treated me, and I loved her and was scared stiff of what was going to happen. But when you get home, 
If you've had four kids, you know life gets busy. And you put that part of your life aside. And you keep moving on because you know life moves on. And then the next week would happen. The most abnormal behavior and the most abnormal stuff becomes normal. Did you ever notice that? It's like crazy. It's total craziness. My dad's melanoma reared its ugly head and that shifted things a little bit. I noticed one day, all of a sudden, you know how you notice? I bought him a jacket. He was a 44 long. He was a big guy. So I come by this rightly. His jacket was like swimming on him. And I said, Dad, are you feeling okay? And he's like, yep, he was fine. But at Easter time, he wished people a Merry Christmas. And I thought, uh-oh, I don't know what's going on. We still didn't do anything. But my son went to spend the weekend with them, and when I picked him up, or my husband picked him up to come home, he said, I'm worried about Jaji because he didn't know what to do with the remote control. He didn't know that he could work the television with it. That was, that was the shifting moment, right, when we realized something's really wrong. It scared my son, it scared me, and I told my sisters, ignorance isn't bliss anymore. Something's wrong with Daddy. We've got to figure this out. Dad got sicker. He went to the doctor, and they told us the good news and the bad news. I hate that phrase. The good news and the bad news. Which one do you want first? You know, like, it's, do you want chocolate ice cream or strawberry ice cream? We took the bad news first, and it was that my dad's cancer which was um, diagnosed five years earlier. He had five very good years, metastasized to everywhere. Well, then what the heck is the good news, do you suppose? The good news was it was in his brain, so he wouldn't suffer that much. He wouldn't feel pain. And that's what the doctors told us. So he could stay home. He could stay in the hospital a while. Then, you know, he'd get chemo. And it was such an offhanded discussion. But this is years ago. It wasn't now. They said he wouldn't be in severe pain. I don't believe that. He was in pain. He, we, opted for some chemo. You know what I was thrilled about? This is how nuts you get. My dad had thick hair, and he used to tease my uncles who had thin hair about how he had to get his hair thinned. His hair didn't fall out. It got thinner as he got thinner, but he still had his hair. Imagine that's what makes me happy now that dad's got hair. Anyhow, chemo and radiation was stopped, but dad fell off the radar again because who could worry about him when we had mom who was beginning to spin out of control? If only we knew that it wasn't worth arguing with her when someone has dementia, arguing, trying to make your point, trying to prove that you were right and she's wrong, it doesn't fly. And yet members of the family would do that. Mom wouldn't know the day of the week, but if she felt like it, she'd get up in the morning and cancel her doctor's appointment or my father's and we'd bring them there and they'd say, oh, the appointment's canceled. We'd want to kill her, or at least I didn't. I don't know about my sisters. <laughs> she didn't want to leave the house. And if we pushed her too hard, she ran away. Fortunately, we lived in a small town. A lot of people knew us. They didn't necessarily know how my mother was, you know, because she was not right, but they would bring her home or we'd find her. The most frustrating moment for me came when it was time to bring my father home. It was his wish to come home. If only we knew that dementia changes in a situation makes the person completely out of, they drop to a level that they never recover from. What was familiar to my mother was no longer the case. Someone had to be in the house if my dad was going to be home, so we had to literally sneak him in the house because when she saw he was in a wheelchair, she thought he doesn't belong at home. That very evening before, she cried all night because she wanted him to come home. He was so happy. She was off the wall. We were so conflicted. When I look back now, retrospectively, I'm not really sure how we got through that particular time in our lives, but we did. When my dad got to the bedroom, he got to a different bedroom because he needed his own space. We had a hospital bed. 
He looked around and he wanted a crucifix. Every room should have a crucifix. This was like the extra bedroom, so it didn't. My dad had great faith. Nearly every visit to his bedroom, every time we rolled him to the kitchen to eat if he could eat very little, every time we brought him in the living room to watch TV for a little while, my mom would flare up. So we were always walking on eggshells. She was scared to death. She was scared to death of death. Because on some level, I know she knew that everything was changing in her life. Her best friend and her ally could not help her when she needed the help the most. I spent the better part of that summer at home. You might ask, well, did you still have four kids? Yep. One was pretty young at the time. I didn't want to bring them home, home to my mother's house and dad's house because there was too much conflict. One was getting ready to go to college, and think of this, the dog died. I think he knew everything was going crazy, so he, <laughs> he got out of the whole situation. In order for our dad to be home, one of us had to be there. And it seemed like the right thing to do, and my husband was, I can't even tell you how my husband was, that he picked up those pieces and watch those kids and did the stuff that needed to be done, mostly driving, by the way, to games, and he loved that anyhow. Most of my stress was relieved driving on the Mass Pike, cursing out the truck drivers, which till this day I'm willing to do, and crying, because I didn't know how anything would ever end or how could it end, and we come out of this hole. The day that I assured my dad that we would take care of my mom, and he said he didn't care. He said, I don't care what happens to your mother anymore, because I don't think I'm going to make it. He was pretty sure he didn't have any f fight in him. I didn't have that end of life talk that you see on television. The daughter sits with the dad, and they have this talk about what a wonderful daddy was and what a wonderful life you had. I couldn't do that. The thing that came so easy for me to do with strangers in the parish and people in the hospital, I could not do with my own father. I knew enough, though, to let my sister know that she and her kids should come visit. She was having a very difficult time. She was not visiting and I knew my kids should come and see him too. My husband drove them over for the day and when I wheeled my dad into the living room for the visit, they never, we never sat in the living room to visit by the way, the living room, I'm not even sure why we had a living room, but it was there. <laughs> the kids were audibly taken back as was my husband because my dad had changed so much in those couple of weeks. When he asked about how they were, especially how baseball was, how my son's achievements were as he was getting ready to go to college on a scholarship. He asked about how the Red Sox were doing, because you know that's what guys talk about when they're dying, how the Red Sox are doing. <laughs> he listened to them on the radio every day. The girls burst out crying. They realized that this emaciated shell of a man was the, the judge that carried them around and would have done anything for them. Things calmed down when he offered them refreshments. Then they left. Their last memory of their grandfather was offering them hospitality. Did I mention how much the family suffers when someone suffers? The whole family suffers. As we were ready to retreat to the bedroom after the visit, my dad kissed my hand. I think what he said was, thank you and I love you. He never said that. Guys didn't say those kinds of things. But he showed his love in a million ways every single day of the week. We were so lucky. And the kids I took care of in Good Shepherd and in Nazareth never had a day of that. That kind of a separation or chasm, I could never quite come to grips with that. That Wednesday, after that Sunday, my dad left too, quietly and obtrusively. I was singing to him, I think, and trying to see if he was breathing. He was on hospice. The day before, by the way, we called the priest 
and uh, the priest was golfing and then someone forgot to tell him so he never came to see my dad by the way my dad was a pillar of the parish it was so disappointing for us because it wouldn't have mattered to dad proud my father was proud and he said that once I never did anything to hurt anybody in all these years he was 84 years old even the world mourned though because the day after my dad died the Friday after the Thursday the Red Sox went on strike and I often wondered what would have happened if dad didn't have that radio by his side the cross on the wall to get him through those last months if only we knew there were so many things left unsaid there were so many questions we were afraid to ask the doctors dads and moms but you know what there was no time to mourn because there was mom how could we not realize that my mother's situation now would be even worse dementia is a miserable imprisonment especially when the person lives in both worlds and at that point that was my mom she was okay and she was terrible she didn't know anything and she knew everything mom needed support but would not let anyone come in we hired someone you know because we thought she'd be best in her home seven of her brothers and sisters lived in the immediate area but they couldn't take care of her the woman was there about a day and she fired her we couldn't leave our families to live with her it was us it was getting to be school time by now after my dad's death and my son's moving to college which by the way he was humiliated that we loaded our station wagon loaded the roof rack with his stuff and all six of us traveled to Arno, Maine he says we're like the Farkles it's so embarrassing <laughs> just leave me off and go that's how he handled his grief I guess so we sort of slunk into the room just to see where he would be and then we left he didn't even look back we're all waving we're crying anyhow I felt guilt about that because of course all summer I wasn't with him so why wouldn't I feel guilty we were raised those of us who were born in the 19th <clears throat> were raised to feel guilty about everything since mom wouldn't live with us she left my sisters we literally abandoned her in a facility in Marlboro that was specifically for Alzheimer's patients and abandoned is what it felt like to me I can't even go there about how it was to see her sitting there but she fell and broke her neck because you know what she was doing fixing the curtains in her room because they didn't know how to fix the curtains she hit the back of a bed and of course was rushed to the hospital and I was sort of the closest I went to see her and her heart was in arrhythmia which was the bigger issue I guess than her broken neck she had a halo you know you know when you think my dad had a saying in the basement I should have taken it it says um, when you're walking along the street I looked it said I saw a sign that said look up things could be worse I looked up and sure enough things got worse that was kind of the sign I wish I had in my basement because now I've got a mom with a broken neck in a hospital in Marlboro I'm back to working sort of full-time if anyone here is young enough to work in the church it's the place to work they were wonderful it didn't matter my family was first I'll always be grateful to Father Rouse to Father Carlson for allowing me that that flexibility our story continues my sister moved to Florida my older sister to retire my younger sister lived in Connecticut so we decided that I would be the primary caretaker of my mom so I insisted she come to a nursing home five minutes from my house it was easier I couldn't keep going back and forth if only we knew that it was okay to lie to people with dementia when my mom was not asking to go home she was looking for my father when dad died I was the upstanding daughter who went to talk to her and try to explain that dad died so then she'd say where's dad I want to see dad and I would say mom dad died mom dad died you know dad was really sick and dad died it was like what an idiot it's you can't even imagine and she'd look at me and she'd say I want to see dad so a psychiatrist said gave me some good advice he said every time you tell your mother the truth 
you re-begin her mourning. So it's okay to lie to her. So when my mom said, where's dad? I said, he went to bingo. Because he went to bingo every Friday night and somehow bingo. And when he went to bingo, she groused about it for 30 years. He's going to bingo. He cares more about the church than he cares about me. That was her line. She said, oh, he cares more about the church than he cares about me. But five minutes later, she forgot about dad. Thank goodness. Now feature my daughter, who's like nine years old, standing there saying, mom, you're lying to Bocce. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, this never ends, does it? I said, you can't lie. Now I hope they lie to me. You can't lie. And this isn't really a lie. This is like just a little thing I have to tell Bocce so she feels better. It's weird. So distress comes in all different kinds of forms. What I didn't know that it was essential to see human things, humorous things. It wasn't irreverent to laugh about some stuff. When my mother was placed in the first Alzheimer's place, um, I went in one day, so she was having a terrible adjustment. And this woman dressed in white had a clipboard, and she said, who are you here to see? I said, I'm here to see Sally. She said, she's doing great. She ate all her lunch, she went to bingo, and she did something else. And I'm like, oh my God, thank you God. My mom is making an adjustment. The director of nursing comes oh, over, it's time to have a break. <laughs> She was one of the Alzheimer's patients. Very young, very sad story. She was a psych nurse. I had to tell you, I did laugh all the way home that day. Talk about being fooled. Another time they told me that my mother was leaving this locked facility. You know, she was there because she was a wanderer. So she, you know, ran away from my sister's house. She tried to take her in Connecticut. But this is a locked facility. She's like, your mother was down in the cafeteria. Your mother was trying to find her way to the chapel. It was the old Good Shepherd place that his uh, regular living and then it had uh, Alzheimer's living. We can't figure out how she's getting out. So one day we go down and have a cup of coffee. My mother loved coffee and sweets. We get on the elevator and I go, Ma, I gotta go get the nurse to get a code. Wait here. She says, we don't need a coat. She took a bobby pin out of her hair. She played with the thing. The elevator took us to one we got off, and we went to the cafeteria. I knew now why and how my mom got out, and I had to figure out, do I tell them or don't I tell them? She was still pretty clever. I felt pretty proud of her, actually, but I'm not going to tell you whether I told or not. At Stonehenge, which was the nursing home where she landed for nine years, imagine being in a nursing home for nine years, my mother. She would regularly chant, I want to go home. I want to go home, I want to go home. Around midnight one night, the staff calls one of the nurses and says, could you ever come over here and talk to your mother? This is when she'd been there a little while. I'm like, okay. So I got out of bed, I put on something, went in. As I opened the door, I could hear this chant, I want to go home, I want to go home. She had the whole entire first floor <laughs> chanting, I want to go home, I want to go home. The nurse said, we would never call you, but it's, we just can't take it anymore. <laughs> I said, all right. So I talked to my mom. Even when she was not able to see, because she had macular degeneration by then, and when she really didn't know what was going on, somehow I would talk to her. And just like you do to a little child. You talk to them, you talk to them, you talk to them. And I read somewhere relatively recently that a daughter's voice can calm a dementia patient, and it certainly did for my mother. If only we knew that the risk of caregiver burnout is real, even for people who are supposed to be strong. Caregivers don't need to feel guilty or frustrated because they don't have time or energy to do the extras. Exercise, who cared about that anyways? Smile, eat right, or get lots of other stuff done. Caregivers need to remember that doing even one little thing for themselves is okay. They don't have to feel that they're being selfish. Even though mom didn't live with us, I tried to visit her every day feed her her supper, change her into her nightgown, 
wash her up and tuck her into bed, then go home and either fix supper or eat the supper my husband fixed. With three kids still at home, honestly, I felt like a circus juggler and wondered, how many years is this? This is really weird. I'm not paying attention to... Father Carlson used to give us this thing when we did marriage prep with the uh, couples. First priority, your spouse. Next priority, your children. Third priority, your family. We weren't raised like that, Father Carlson. So it was always juggling. My husband, Charlie, would go visit mom on Saturdays. So he'd take her from her bed and put her in her chair. And he'd lay on her bed. And he'd put on the football game or the basketball game or the whatever game. And the nurses would bring him a snack because they thought he was so sweet. And he'd hold my mom's hand. And he called her a sacrament because she made him holy. That was my respite and my joy and source of gratitude that we could, that he would do that. Of course, he was getting out of chores, too. <laughs> we have to pick and choose our priorities and let the rest go. Some people have said that illnesses like dementia and cancer and mesothelioma choose their own battles. However, others have shared that initially they tried to do everything right, but as time went on, they weren't able to live up to their own expectations. It's important to change the focus so that what's the thing to be done at the moment is what you do, and don't worry about the whole grand picture because it'll kill you. Much of my sadness was cloaked in guilt that came from not fulfilling our familial expectations. In our culture, I grew up in a Polish ghetto in Western Mass. No one ever put anyone away. My grandmother, who had dementia with six daughters and four sons living in the vicinity, and an array of grandchildren, didn't have to go anywhere. She had all the time care. My aunts and my mother's friends were angry at us. They could not understand how mom could be put away. When one of them, however, had dementia many years later, the decision was to have her go to a nursing home. No one fretted. My mom had blazed yet a different family trail for that family that she loved so much. By the way, my mother had a phrase, but the last thing she could do before she dies was recite all the siblings in the order of their birth in Polish over and over again. That was her mantra. Sadly, because I moved my mother to Boston, her siblings rarely visited. They blame me, but I don't think that was why they didn't visit. In our little group, we didn't go anywhere. If we went from South Hadley to Springfield, that was a trip. So Boston was really something. If only I knew that my mom faded away long before she died, she ceased being my mother. I only accepted that when one day when we were together, she sincerely looked at me. This is before she got really bad. And she said, are you my mother? I said, no, Mom, I'm Fran. I'm your daughter. Why are you asking me that? She said, because you're so nice to me. You're like my mother. On that day, I became the mother of my mother. So how could I not take care of her? Would a mother ever abandon her child? My mother lost most of her words as she did the rest of her faculties, and all of a sudden, my sister wanted to have a feeding tube inserted. And I said, no, we can't do that. The nurses came in and sat on her bed because her mantra by then was, thank you, God bless you, I love you, and she held their hands. My mom finally went home on Epiphany 2003. I was graced to be with her. I got there early that morning as I was with my father. If only I knew that Charlie would get fatally ill two months after my mother died, I'm not sure I would have prioritized all those years differently. We always think we have time, don't we? We always think the future's ours. When Charlie's persistent low in the gut cough did not subside, he had a myriad of tests and finally was diagnosed with malignant pleural 
I think it's pleural malignant mesothelioma. That night my son called to tell us he was engaged. Charlie was a teacher and a social worker with no known asbestos exposure, so he was a conundrum. And our new battle ensued, the battle for my husband's life. If you look up mesothelioma in the dictionary, and they told us the same thing, don't be Googling this, don't be Googling this, which of course, as soon as they say it, you Google it. It says very rare, treatment can help, but can't be cured. But, there's always a but, isn't there? In the medical world, at Brigham and Women, there was an up-and-coming star, Dr. David Sugarbaker, who just died a couple months ago. He was a pioneering surgeon in this mesothelioma that would not cure, but that could extend a person's life. We went to a class, two classes, three classes about it. Charlie was not interested in an extra pleural pneumonectomy. He did not want one lung removed along with part of his pericardium, part of his diaphragm, and part of the pleura. He did not want to be a number in some stupid trial. But all I heard was it could give him 10 more years. And I talked about a hope and a vision at 56 he would be able to maybe see Laura graduate from college, John get married, maybe the other girls get married, maybe have a grandchild or two. So I tried to talk him into this surgery. As he was accepted into the trial, he accepted the trial. I wonder, does anyone have the right to talk anyone into or out of some kind of life-extending surgery. If only I knew. In September, Charlie had the very painful, extensive surgery that he didn't want. Essentially, you're cut everywhere. When David Sugarbaker came out to the waiting room three hours after the surgery started, it was going to be a seven to nine hour surgery, I was confused. He stood there and he said, as I was standing up, we couldn't do it. I looked at him and I, I thought he was joking. I laughed. I said, what do you mean you couldn't do it? Can you even imagine making a stupid comment like that? He said, we couldn't do it because the mesothelioma had infiltrated his abdominal wall. It invaded too much. But if he wants, we can do chemo. And he left. I stood up to shake his hand and thank him for some strange reason. I wanted to thank him and sat down and cried and knew that today was not one of my best faith days. How would I ever tell the kids? Did I mention that when one family member suffers, the entire family suffers? The kids by now Google. The kids by now were beating themselves up about everything that they ever said to their father and who doesn't say things to their mom and dad. The morning after surgery, Charlie was amazingly alert, but he was confused by something. Dr. Sugarbaker came in early and said he was looking good. And the nurse came in and said his lungs sounded good. Did you hear what the nurse said? Your lungs sound good. But Fran, he said, Shouldn't I just have one lung? Now, it's my job to tell him what happened with the surgery. I had a choice to lie, because I was accustomed to doing that with my mother, who died, you know, like seven months before, or tell him the truth. I did the latter and explained what I heard. He was, he was disappointed. He'll say, he said something he didn't usually say, but that word that we don't want people to say. And I left the room. For the second time in my life, I had an opportunity to sit down with someone I loved and have some kind of a meaningful discussion. And I walked out and cried because I didn't want him to think I lost hope because I did lose hope. Hope's a tricky thing. It's a feeling of expectation and desire for certain things to happen. My job in this team had always been to be the hope giver. Even when intellectually I knew better, I led with my heart. 
imagine I couldn't even have an intelligent conversation with my husband about his surgery. But then again, neither did his surgeon or nurse or anyone on his team. I was feeling such extreme sadness for him and such anger and disappointment in the whole medical field. But who could I tell? Charlie spent his 57th birthday at the Brigham and Women's Hospital while the entire family went to celebrate his birthday with tickets we purchased months before to the Lion King. He insisted we go. The next day I secretly purchased a cemetery plot for us because I knew my lion would not be victorious. It was a difficult recuperation, maybe because it was from a meaningless surgery, I don't know. He hated when a nurse or aide would display the faces from big and smiling to sad and crying and ask him to attach a number to his pain. He could not understand how anyone could attach a number to pain, physical, much less psychological. Charlie came home and got a bit stronger. He walked the dog. Our aging German shepherd became his marathon companion. He washed the dishes. He wanted me to go to work. He attended his future daughter-in-law shower to see everyone, and people were shocked because they hardly recognized him. But I thought he looked pretty good. He wanted to keep the routine. His brother, and it, he started chemo. He did start chemo. To my delight, his insanely curly, he had this Dr. Einstein kind of hair that I hated when it wasn't <laughs> cut. It didn't fall out though, so he still sort of looked like himself. His boss and brother visited and I ran interference when I knew he was tired and asked people to leave. He watched with great interest as the Red Sox won the pennant that year. In fact, that's what he discussed with his visitors and with his son, how the Red Sox were doing. Isn't that what you would talk about? He hated when people asked how he was feeling. How the F do they think I'm feeling? <laughs> I'm glad he didn't say that to them. Keep it normal. Hope looks like normal. We even drove to Mount Benedict. He approved of our new real estate facing west, but we never talked about his death. I couldn't tell him about the patient at the Brigham who dying at age 72 confided in me that he could not say, why me, God? Because when he had all the blessings for the previous 72 years, he never said, why me, God? Mine was a persistent why by now. In the evening, when the kids were doing whatever kids do, we sat on the porch and talked about how good our life was, how blessed we were, what great kids we had, of the wedding that was coming up. He was worried that he was not a good enough provider. He had no pension in case something happened to him. But getting out of work to see your kids' games and working with kids to keep them out of jail your whole life, and besides, we always had enough, Charlie, was my feeble and uninvited response. Ever the fixer, I robbed him of an opportunity to talk about what he was feeling. On December 22nd, the night before his appointment, to be fitted for a tuxedo for his son's wedding. After a pleasant soiree to friendlies with a dear friend, Charlie collapsed in our living room. And as our daughter tried to resuscitate him, I hoped she wouldn't. I remember the woman at the hospital with end-stage mesothelioma who could not catch her breath, and I didn't want that for him. Was I actually willing my husband to die? He was so light in my arms, this is a six foot three guy who was always like a 46 long. He was so easy to cradle, but I'm not even sure I said I love you to him. The EMTs did resuscitate him and we brought him to the Brigham to a room with an incredible view of the city he loved. Did I mention he was from New York and transformed his loyalties from New York to the Red Sox, from the Yankees to the Red Sox? He had lines coming out and tubes coming out of everywhere and he was tethered to the machine that breathed for him. And my daughter beat herself up for not doing a good a job to resuscitate him sooner and for not skipping the last semester because she could have been home with him. What she doesn't know is he would have killed her so it wouldn't have worked. <laughs> we had a week-long wake 
over Christmas. People streamed in to say goodbye. The kids stayed close and his brother was positive he was responding. We ate Christmas dinner in a family waiting room because the nurse on duty that day said we couldn't bring any food in the room because it was unsanitary. <laughs> and then a doctor proposed that he have surgery in case he would have another clot. You got to know that I talked to so many people and helped them decide as a chaplain and as a pastoral associate what you do at the end of life and what you don't have to do. Even in our Catholic faith, what you do and what you have to do, and I was pretty sure he doesn't need surgery. But I was overwhelmed and I was stuck. A nurse from somewhere said, you know, you don't have to have him have the surgery. You can, you can not do this. And it was like a, a, a light dawned on me. It was my decision now. I prayed. So I lost faith, you know, sometimes, but most of the time, what do you hang on to if you don't have faith? I didn't consult with my children about what to do. I didn't want to put that onus on them when I decided to remove life support. I told them what would happen say what they wanted to say to him. By now he had been unconscious that entire week. The staff began removing meds and finally the machine turned off the machine, I don't know what order it was in, and said they did not know how long it would take and left the room. Imagine guessing how long it would take for a person to die. Charlie began to breathe on his own. To hope or not to hope, my children didn't know better but I did. Early in the morning of December 29, Charlie's blood pressure plummeted, as did his respirations. Thank you. God bless you. I love you. I whispered my mother's words to him and was indifferent to the activity around us. Charlie's wake was incredible. For a guy who wasn't like an important guy other than to us, scores of people waited in line in the sleety rain. Holy Name Church was filled to capacity for his funeral. And 11 days later in the same church, at his son's wedding, a candle was lit in remembrance of this truly good man. Following Charlie's death and John's wedding, spring was a whirlwind of activity. A million death certificates, filling out insurance forms, trying to get the taxes done. By the way, till this day I copy what he had for our last tax return. Only change the amount that I made. <laughs> Apply for financial aid for my daughter. Be familiar with jobs that were his jobs. And then I had to put down our dog who pined for him. Riker was a German shepherd and when Charlie died, every time he'd hear the van, he'd go to the door and wait and he could hardly walk. The vet and staff of the animal hospital were amazingly sensitive. They could not know the tears that were mostly for Charlie and my mom and my dad, not for Riker. There was no time for tears for my mom and my dad and my husband. My job was to comfort. I think it was then that my emotional armor, not to steal your word, Jody, not only was cracked, but it totally disintegrated and I wept. By the way, the hospital called, the vet hospital called the next day to see how I was doing. The regular hospital never did that. <laughs> then I had a root canal and open heart surgery, so within five months of Charlie's death, this was the roller coaster. But it was good because I didn't have time to think. Maybe Charlie's extra pleural pneumonectomy, number 3213, if he had to be assigned a number, did help someone. I'd be a liar if I said I don't miss him still or could revel in the joy of him seeing his children as parents or help with the grandchildren and watch them at their games now and shovel the damn snow. <laughs> this past December 22nd when our eight-week-old grandson was hospitalized with bacterial meningitis for six weeks and then was rushed back to children's in respiratory distress. I railed at Charlie to leave him alone and not take him. Had I really lost it, the baby's fine, by the way. He's the one that I take care of. 
We know our loved ones never truly leave us. If only we knew families continually struggle to do the right thing in an inexact field where there are more questions than there are answers. People who are truly important to us, our loved ones never really leave us, and they would be the first ones to tell us that it's okay, we're doing a good job. Only when we say and accept that we did the best we could with what we knew can we be healed and have hope again. But sometimes that takes a long time. Two ladies left this morning and I went out to chat with them and said that very thing to them and you would have thought they still couldn't get past their brain surgery and what Dr. Stern was saying was too much for them. But we have to believe we do the best we can. It's not always easy to focus on what we had. Sometimes we get lost in what we, get, we think we've lost. Charlie sang the song today to our children every night. And I noticed that even our three-year-old grandchild knows the word. So his presence is felt in ways other than a child hugging a cold cemetery stone and proudly telling me that they hugged Pop-Pop today. A million tomorrow shall all pass away ere I forget the joy that is mine today. Thank you. We've had an extraordinary morning. We've had stories, we've had lessons, we've had extraordinary um, generous sharing. <laughs> and I was going to summarize things, kind of wrap things up, and it's such a sterile and pretty awful thing that I had planned to do, but I'm going to do it anyway because we have to wrap things up and we need to leave here knowing that all of us probably have within us the ability to respond in the ways, the three remarkable ways that we've heard today. And if we haven't got that or we don't know that we have that within us, then we have, as Jody put it this morning, a call to action. We have things to work on, things to do. So when we're, we're faced with, and we heard remarkable stories that were fraught, fraught with moral distress and amazing responses to it. And what we saw were examples of, I'm gonna skip that slide for a minute, finding or developing moral courage and building or developing moral resilience. You know, I loved that Fran left, with the, left us with the, the message that you do what you have to do. You find within yourself that which you need to do what you have to do. And, and that is the story of humans facing stressful, distressful, physiologically stressful, and morally stressful situations. That is what we do. And we have heard three remarkable journeys of how that was done by our speakers this morning. I want to call your attention, how about this, for bringing us back to just something dry, scholarly, and academic, so our tear ducts can get a break for the morning. Um, Samuel Coleridge first talked about um, uh, moral courage in s his lifetime, and I don't know what year this quote was, but he, he talked about co um, moral courage as being that which enables us to remain steadfast and resolute despite disapproval. And I would add to that, despite circumstances about which we have no control. Because as we talk about the sources of moral distress, some of them are constraints beyond which we have nothing that we can do. And some of it is, as I said earlier, uncertainty or conflict. But whatever it is, it's not just disapproval. But above other things, insisting that what is right is done in spite of the risk or ridicule or loss of position. So that was something that was devoid of a healthcare context and, and that Samuel Coleridge said several hundred years ago. J.S. Murray, in this century, wrote about moral courage as the willingness to stand up for and act according to, which, to one's ethical beliefs when moral principles are threatened, regardless of the perceived or actual risks which is interesting because sometimes they are just perceived, but that's when perception becomes reality, right? 
And the risks can be stress, anxiety, isolation from family members or colleagues. You know, a lot of the, the quotes that we're giving to you today come from the healthcare literature, so they talk about <laughs> healthcare professionals. But it can be isolation from family, from friends, from your work colleagues or threats to employment, threats to your social standing, threats to your place in your family. But you have to be willing to stand up for and act according to one's ethical beliefs. What's interesting to me is that um, sometimes we do it instinctively, but very often, and I liked, Fran, the way that you kept saying, if I had known, if we had known, a lot of time it's a post facto learning and how great it is that we very often have the opportunity for post facto learning. Sometimes hard, sometimes by accident, sometimes uh, somewhat set up, but we have that opportunity for post facto learning. We also have that opportunity to learn from others. And today we had three extraordinarily generous speakers share with us their stories, <coughs> their journeys, from which we can learn for our own that lie ahead of us. The other response to moral distress is building and developing moral resilience. And that's a phrase that we hear a lot about these days, an awful lot about these days. But um, Cinda Rushton, whom I mentioned earlier, she's done some extraordinary work at Hopkins on moral distress and moral resilience. She gives us some tips on how we can build moral resilience. And I think it's kind of a nice note on which to kind of wrap up the presentation part of our day today. She encourages us to foster self-awareness, to develop a self-regulatory capacity. You know, that's kind of that self-edit, impose a filter on our behavior, on our thoughts, on our actions, which, you know, we're not a species known for self-restraint, but that's what, what, what she's asking of us. Uh, figure out self-restraint. She talks about developing ethical competencies. You know, what are the source of your moral values, your moral teaching? Learn those sources. Develop them. Be conscious about integrating them into our lives, right? So develop a sense of competency about these things based first and foremost on knowledge, but then on practice. It's a wonderful tip. It's a pretty self-evident one, but it's a great one. Speak up with clarity and confidence. You know, if there's one thing that we heard consistently throughout the morning, it's, it's the need to speak up on some occasions. And you can only do that when you feel like you have something to say, that you're going to speak knowledgeably and confidently because of what it is that you know. So it kind of feeds back to those, those other points that Cinder Rushton makes here. You know, learn your stuff. Pay attention. You know, um, <laughs> I don't know why. I always think of that phrase in French. I, I used to live in France, and somehow it sounds more authoritative to say, faites attention, pay attention. You know, <laughs> look around. There are opportunities for learning, for self-learning as well, but for learning and, and being taught and learning from others as we are doing this morning. And then once you have that sense of knowing what you know, start to exercise it, speak up and feel uh, speak clearly and confidently. Feel competent about it. Find meaning in the midst of despair. You know, several times, Mary Buss made a, a great point today about those who are fortunate enough to have the gift of faith being able to find meaning in suffering. I can remember as a um, kind of I, before I was a nurse, I, I studied philosophy and did my first degree in philosophy. And I remember um, telling people in a, a medical ethics discussion course as an undergrad that you need to find meaning in suffering. And, you know, obviously I didn't come up with that one on my own. I thought I heard it somewhere and it kind of made sense to me. But I remember looking around this group of folks from other colleges as, as well as my own, and there was just this kind of mystifying look at, uh, you know, back at me like, what on earth are you talking about? The idea is to get rid of suffering. And of course, you know, that would be the first thing. We're not masochistic, nor are we taught necessarily to be that way. But come on, let's get real. There are times when there is just nothing we can do about that. And so what do we do? We look for meaning in it. We look, not I don't mean cause or explanation or who to blame. I mean meaning. That's a difficult thing to do. As people of faith, it's easier. 
we've had, as Mary pointed out, an exquisite model for this. But it's a wonderful thing. And, and so when I read Cinda's writings and see find meaning in the midst of despair, there is nothing more desperate sometimes than unexplained or untreatable uh, pain and suffering, both existential and physical. So look for meaning in it. Find something to do with it. For those of us who come from the Catholic community and, and, and many faith communities, we offer it up. You know, it, it, we, we place a value on it and we, we give it. We offer it as a gift for someone else. Find meaning, whatever that meaning is for you. Engage with others. That kind of speaks for itself. You know, there is nothing worse, I think, than pain suffered in a sense of isolation and alone. So reach out to others, look for others. You know, that, that expression that I, I swear every cliche, as you've heard me say every year, you know, comes from truth. So misery loves company, find the company. There are other people who are suffering like you or have suffered before you and find them, engage with others. And sometimes you engage with others just to distract yourself from your own suffering, but do it. Participate in transformational learning. Um, that's part of what we did this morning and, and Jody gave us a great example of it in his own life. You know, how do we take what we are experiencing, what we have learned, what we've seen others experience or learn, and change ourselves and change our lives and change the lives of those around us in a meaningful way. Engage and participate. Not just see it, not just hear it or read about it, but participate in transformational learning and contribute to an, a culture of ethical practice. We want, you know, just the theme today is about the um, sometimes strain and stress of doing the right thing. It's easier when you're in a culture where the right thing is part of what you do. So you get help for it, you get advice and guidance, you get support for it. What smarter thing to do than to build that culture? so that we live in that way. It's part of, you know, again, going back to the whole reason for our initiative in palliative care, it's to build a culture of palliative care. We will get tremendous support, not just in our, our healthcare communities, and we will do that. Eventually, we're seeing more and more permeation of good, robust palliative care services being offered, but in a society where that's the goal. You know, for another day, we need to talk about this incredible um, cultural shift in our country that sees things like physician-assisted suicide being legalized. We don't want that culture. We want the culture where we mitigate suffering, where we know what to do about it, where we know how to take care of others and watch to try to prevent and at the very least help to mitigate suffering when we see it not to do away with the sufferer. That just strikes me as so wrong-headed. But again, we'll have uh, other sessions that will spend more time on that. And then finally, and I, I thought this was kind of interesting as you're talking about building uh, moral resilience, I think it's kind of interesting that she says you make a commitment to moral resilience. As we planned the conference this year, I, I said at the beginning of our meeting that we're really building on uh, what we did last year, caring for the caregivers, and now kind of plunging a bit deeper into what does that look like and what are some of the stories and the tales and the journeys of caregivers that we can learn from. And, and we purposely, and I think successfully, um, decided to look at it in a kind of multi uh, factorial way. You know, there are a lot of aspects to being a caregiver, what that looks like, as we said in the title of the morning, on both sides of the, the bed rail. And so um, I think, you know, our speakers today could not have could not have done a better job in trying to flesh out the theme of the day for us. And so I'm really grateful to each of you. Really grateful.